Order, order. Before I call Jim Fitzpatrick to move the motion, I'd just like to draw your attention to the fact that the, the proceedings today are being made accessible for people uh, who are deaf or have problems with hearing and are using British Sign Language. So if you could bear that in mind in the course of your contributions, I think that would be helpful for everyone. Okay, I call Jim Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Mr McCabe, I, I beg to move that the House has considered deafness and hearing loss. Mr McCabe, it's a, a pleasure to see you in the chair today, but even more pleased to see that our debate has been interpreted into sign language, which I believe is a, um, a, a parliamentary first, so we may be making history in this debate, which is great uh, for all of us who are here to, to participate in, in this event. I'm grateful to the Backbends Business Committee for the opportunity to open this debate. I'm very pleased to see um, so many colleagues have been able to join us here and will be contributing to this important discussion. It's good to see the Minister in his place, even though it's not exactly as brief, and I look forward to hearing the wind-ups from the opposition uh, spokespersons and the government in due course. I want to place on, uh, on record my thanks to the UK Council on Deafness, Action on Hearing Loss, the National Deaf Children's Society, Deaf Plus, the Adult Cochlear Implant Action Group and Brian Lamb, Deaf Olympics GB, Access Bedford and 3 Network for their assistance in preparing for this debate, and of course the House of Commons Library. That's a, a long list, uh, Mr McKay, but given that there are 11 million people across the UK living with hearing loss, the list could have been much longer. But the UK Council on Deafness, for example, represents 43 deaf or hearing loss organisation, so they, they produced a collective briefing. I should record that I wear two hearing aids of my own, and I'm chair of your party parliamentary group on deafness. There are too many issues um, for me to raise personally, uh, Mr McCabe, and it would be unfair of me not to share the time that we have as equitably as possible among those of us who are here. So I'm going to focus on three key issues. Those will be access to work, legal recognition of British Sign Language and the implementation of the National Action Plan on Hearing Loss. And I've timed this at 13 and a half minutes. But just before I do, I'd like to put a brief marker down on several other issues that I haven't got time to raise in detail. And they are cochlear implants. I had an adjournment debate uh, on this in March this year. The Minister responding advised that NICE would consult by the end of the summer on new proposals. That consultation is still awaited, and any information from the Minister would be very welcome. ICIPS, the question of improving paediatric audiology services across the country by accrediting such services through the Improving Quality and Physiological Services Programme has been a request for some time. I'd welcome an update on any progress, either on voluntary accreditation or, if unsatisfactory, whether the government has given more thought to make it, making it compulsory. On Deaf Olympics, any information from the Minister or discussions his department may have had with his colleagues at DCMS about support for our Deaf athletes would be very welcome. On early years intervention, the first three and a half years are critical for the development of listening and spoken language. I'd be grateful if the Minister has had any updates on government thinking about ensuring audio auditory verbal is put on the patient pathway as a follow-up to the newborn hearing screening. And finally, some positive news on telecommunication services. The briefing from three shared how they provide services for their deaf or hard of hearing customers, and from Deaf Plus, whose BSL advice line has this week been shortlisted for a National Helplines Partnership Award. So well done then. Now in respect of the three issues I mentioned at the start, Mr McKay, firstly, access to work. I think it's important to acknowledge that one in six of our population is living with some form of hearing loss. That's around 11 million people. Estimates show nearly 90,000 use British Sign Language as their first language. The government's access scheme provides grants to disabled people to allow them to have equal participation in the workforce. Access to work has revolutionised the career opportunities of deaf people, shattering the glass ceiling that had previously limited deaf people to manual jobs. 
It's been largely due to access to work that deaf people have progressed as far as their talent allows and why there are now deaf chief executive officers, deaf ministry of justice intermediaries and deaf theatre directors among other senior, senior professionals. In March 2015, the then minister announced, however, that the government were going to impose a cap. This cap means that the scheme will no longer properly support those deaf and disabled people for whom support costs are more expensive. For deaf people who are self-employed or entrepreneurs, there is no employer to make up the difference between the award and the need. In a recent answer, the Department for Work and Pensions indicated that they were unable to provide figures for the number of people still in receipt of awards above the cap. The UK Council of Deafness conducted their own survey to establish the impact of the cap on deaf people. The survey had 87 responses, 60 from those who will be capped in April 2018, which given that fewer than 200 people identified in the equality assessment could be in this situation, this is a high response rate. As a consequence, deaf people tell us that they are already apl avoiding applying for work in professional, managerial and senior roles that will be capped. The cap on access to work awards risk imposing a glass ceiling for deaf and disabled people in their work. 46% said they would not apply for promotions. 20% said they had not applied because they were worried. 44% said they would stay with their current employer for as long as possible as they were worried about a new employer. So in this respect, Mr McCabe, I ask of the Minister, will the government look again at the evidence opposing the cap on access to work awards? Does the government accept that set at a level of £42,100, I know amended today by the Secretary of State in his statement to £43,000, that that cap on access to work is too low and is still too low. And if the Minister will not remove the cap, will he, will he consider raising the cap to a level that provides deaf people with more of the support they need? And finally, has the Government considered that it might inadvertently have created legitimate financial grounds on which employers can discriminate against BSL job applicants? Now, I recognise these are mainly DWP issues, so I'd be grateful for the Minister would ensure that these are passed on and raised in the appropriate quarter if he can't respond today. But the Secretary of State, in response to my question in the Chamber uh, about an hour ago, said that they were still looking at evidence on this. And I would hope that means the door's still open because the increase of £1,000 is, um, it clearly doesn't cut it. In general employment terms, there are hurdles for hearing loss people getting into work normally anyway. A YouGov survey commissioned by Action on Hearing Loss found 35% of business leaders stated that they didn't, do not feel confident about their business employing a person with hearing loss. 57% agreed that there is a lack of support or advice available for employers about employing people with hearing loss and that access to work is still the DWP's best kept secret. 63% of business leaders in a YouGov poll had never heard of access to work. If I move on to British Sign Language, Mr McCabe. BSL is the first or preferred language of over 80,000 deaf people in the UK, as I've mentioned before. A total of over 150,000 individuals use BSL at home. In 1987, the B British Deaf Association, the BDA, launched a call for the legal recognition of British Sign Language. In 2003, following extensive lobbying, BSL was officially recognised as a language in its own right by the Department of Work and Pensions. In 2009, the UK Government ratified the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which states that governments must uphold rights by, and I quote, accepting and facilitating the use of sign languages in official interactions and recognising and promoting the use of sign languages, unquote. Despite formal recognition by the UK government that BSL is a language in its own right, there has been no further progress towards a legal status for BSL. In the devolved administrations, the situation is different. In 2012, a consultation for a BSL Scotland Act was initiated, culminating in the passing of that Act. In 2017, the Scottish Government published its first BSL national plan. In 2016, a sign language framework consultation was launched in Northern Ireland. 
despite this, there is still no pathway in place for legal recognition of BSL across the UK. With legal recognition of BSL comes the rights of deaf people and the benefits for both deaf people and wider society alike, and they are far-reaching. On education, deaf children are 42% less likely to achieve five A to A or more GSEs at grade C or above than their hearing peers. There is no reason that a deaf child should do any worse than a hearing child. In health, 70% of deaf people who haven't been to a GP recently wanted to go, but didn't, mainly because there was no interpreter. Deaf people who've been told they might have high blood pressure are three times more likely than everyone else to still not have it under control. Deaf people are almost twice as likely to experience mental health issues which can be exacerbated by social exclusion. A health economic study showed that eliminating poor diagnosis could save the NHS £30 million annually. And it's worth noting, uh, Mr McCabe, in families, 90% of deaf children are born into hearing families. The call to government is that the deaf community want the government to acknowledge the benefits of legal recognition of BSL and commit to establishing a UK-wide sign language framework consultation for a UK-wide sign language act. The British Deaf Association is asking for this consultation process to be led by an appropriate government department whose rem remit covers language. And here is another major obstacle and question to the minister. Which government department and which minister leads on BSL? I've been writing for some time trying to find out. I've even put down a parliamentary question to the Cabinet Office, and the answer that solicited was, quote, all government departments have a responsibility to create inclusive communications. This does not mean promoting BSL as an activity in itself, but it does mean identifying and meeting the communication needs of the audiences we are targeting, unquote. Now, sorry, Minister, but that's nowhere clear enough and demonstrates, I think, why BSL is stranded. No department responsible, no minister responsible, no champion in government responsible, no advocacy, no progress. Finally, on BSL and the case for a BSL GCSE, even though British Sign Language is a recognised language within the UK, it is not available as a GCSE that can be taught in schools. A GCSE has already been piloted and is largely ready to go. However, the Department for Education is declining to give it the go-ahead. There is a principle of fairness and justice here, Mr McCabe. BSL is an official language in the UK, used by, used by tens of thousands of people. Not allowing it to be taught as a GCSE implies that it has a lower status and importance. It could be even seen as discriminatory against deaf people. And we don't have enough deaf interpreters. I think there are 89,000 registered deaf interpreters from the briefings that we have all received, uh, which for dealing with the over hundreds of 100,000 people uh, clearly uh, isn't adequate. And the last of my three areas um, I wish to raise, uh, Mr McCabe, is on the implementation of the Action Plan on Hearing Loss, which when published was widely welcomed. The Department of Health and NHS English passed, published the Action Plan on Hearing Loss in March 2015. This cross-government plan not only recognises hearing loss as a major public health issue, but highlights the major impacts of hearing loss and also commits the government to improving services for everyone living with hearing loss. It also sets out the need to reduce variation in provision of services through the development of NICE guidelines and on adult onset hearing loss. The report sets out five key objectives in the following areas. Early diagnosis, good prevention, integrated services, increased independence and ageing, and good learning outcomes. And as I say, there was wide support for the plan. As part of the implementation of the action plan, NHS England published its commissioning framework for hearing loss services in July 2016, and it's essential that it is properly disseminated by NHS England and that it is fully adopted by uh, clinical commissioning groups. And to help this, in addition in September this year, NHS published its what works guides action plan on hearing loss, providing advice to commissioners and providers and supporting people with hearing loss in a variety of different settings. NHS England is also eminently set to publish guidance setting out the need for health and wellbeing boards to consider people with hearing loss 
when commissioning services, as well as its data tool. So here the requests of government are ver ver fairly straightforward, Mr McCabe, because the frameworks are in place. The UK Council on Deafness are asking the government to work with NHS England, commissioners and professional bodies for me medical professionals to raise the importance of early diagnosis for hearing loss, provide an produce an analysis of the case for hearing screening, potentially adding hearing screening to the NHS, check, NHS health check provided to people in England aged 40 to 70, raise the importance of promoting the commissioning framework through NHS England. The framework provides a clear alternative to the decommissioning of hearing aids and CCG should be aware of that document when designing and commissioning local services. In conclusion, um, uh, uh, Mr McCabe, I think it's fair to say that on the three major issues I've raised, the government has a mixed report card. On access to work, the government started very positively, faltered, and now could be going backwards. We need um, the Secretary of State's response to my question in the Chamber about continuing to look at the evidence to be serious, because the evidence, as I hope I've laid out, is very much there. On BSL, the government never really got started, and that's not the Minister's government, that's the British government, which covers both sides of the, uh, the Chamber. Um, and we're still stalled, and there's no sign of even a ignition switch to start movement. We need a champion in government. And on the action plan, the government started well, maintains progress, and needs to move through the gears that that progress continues and secures the promised outcomes. We all need more of the same, because that was a very, a very welcome start by the whole deaf and hearing loss community. Mr McCabe, finally, uh, this is an important debate. Um, I'm very grateful so many colleagues have managed to be here this afternoon to participate. I'm grateful for the opportunity to open and I look forward to the contributions that follow. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered deafness and hearing loss. I call Ian Stewart. McCabe, it's a great pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Um, and may I first start by uh, congratulating uh, the honourable gentleman from uh, Poplar and Limehouse uh, for his success in securing this debate uh, and also setting out the case uh, with his customary courtesy and passion. Uh, and you know, he's been a, a champion of, of these issues for, for many, many years. So I, I really pay him a heartfelt uh, tribute uh, for that. Uh, before I move into the, the substance of my uh, speech, uh, Mr McCabe, I would like firstly just to comment on the fact that we are, uh, as uh, Mr Fitzpatrick said, having this as the first debate uh, to be transmitted uh, via BSL. Um, unfortunately, this news of this came too late for one of my constituents, uh, Christopher Jones, who did want uh, to attend today. Uh, but decided not to travel down from Milton Keynes because he didn't think this facility uh, would be available. Um, so perhaps, uh, Mr McCabe, you could report back uh, to the Speaker's panel uh, that provision of this interpretation uh, should be considered to be more widely available, uh, not just for debates on this subject, but for general debates we have uh, in this place, um, so that we are as accessible uh, to, as possible to all our constituents. So I'd be grateful if you could take that back uh, to the panel. Uh, the, the particular issue I would like to uh, focus on today uh, is the introduction of a nationwide telecommunication relay service. Uh, this was my, my constituent, Mr Jones, uh, came to see me about this a few weeks ago. Um, in most advanced economies, uh, there is a na na nationwide telecommunications relay service, I'm going to abbreviate it to TRS, uh, which provides functionally equivalent telephone transmission services uh, to deaf and hard of hearing individuals. TRS means telephone transmission services that provide the ability for an individual who is deaf or hard of hearing uh, to have the same telephone availability uh, as someone who is of, of good hearing. Uh, as telephone services and technologies evolve, so does the scope and the achievement of this uh, functional equivalence. Uh, at one time, type text communication was considered the functional equivalent of voice communication. But in the 21st century, uh, captioning video and other technologies have changed what equivalency means. Uh, and the, the, the gaps that are now there between the, the 
what's available to hearing individuals and those with uh, hearing deficiency uh, is a growing gap. And sadly, uh, in the UK, where we once uh, were the first to introduce such uh, systems, uh, we now lag well behind other countries such as the US, Australia, Canada and New Zealand. Uh, functionally equivalent telephone services must be addressed, including but not limited to the following. The unrestricted availability of relay services provided on a 24-hour, seven days a week basis. Emergency preparedness and response to ensure delivery of relay services in the event of disruptions to uh, telecommunication services and international capacity. Uh, telephone services to access the full array of existing telephone uh, services offered by uh, telecommunications companies. Uh, importantly, competition, innovation and choice so that uh, users can access a wide range uh, of services. What works for some people in some circumstances uh, might be different to what others need. There are different facilities available uh, and it's important that each user can choose uh, the, the system that works best for them uh, at any one time. And that might mean for one individual having a, uh, different things at different times. My constituent says he would use one means to communicate with his family and a different one to uh, do business uh, conversations. Um, there's many other issues as well that uh, need to be considered. Um, and while they might seem like lofty goals, uh, they are currently being delivered uh, in those countries I've mentioned. For example, Australia provides the following relay services. Text phone to voice and voice to text phone. Text phone voice carryover, text phone hearing carryover, speech to speech, vi video relay services, internet relay, mobile text relay, mobile SMS relay, caption telephone uh, on the phone and web and caption telephone to braille display. Uh, in Australia, the, the system uh, as a national service has operated since 1995 and is available to every Australian at no additional cost uh, to consumers on a 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week basis. And there's been a number of uh, studies uh, since this introduction uh, to look at the impact uh, that it has had. And it is, some of the findings uh, are you might think obvious, but it is important to, to mention them. Uh, the access to these enhanced relay services is positively associated with reductions in feelings of frustration uh, with telephone use. Uh, it, for individuals, it gives them a much higher quality of life. Uh, it's, Yes, access to work, as uh, the Honourable Gentleman mentioned, uh, but it's also as proven to reduce uh, the wider health consequences that can arise from isolation, uh, feelings of mental health issues, uh, and the cost saving uh, is likely to exceed the cost of introduction of this service. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman, I think I heard him mention a figure of £30 million annually that could be saved uh, from the, the health and social care budgets uh, if many of these feelings of social exclusion uh, were dealt with. Um, ironically, my constituent uh, was involved in setting up, uh, designing and setting up such a system many years ago. Um, it had to close down in 2008. Uh, he couldn't make it work. And part of the problem was that there was uh, a bureaucratic muddle and delay. Because this is often a cross-party, uh, not cross-party, cross-departmental uh, issue. We have the Minister from the Department for Health here, but it's as much uh, DCMS matter and DWP. And the potential benefits from the system my constituent introduced could not be realised because there was buck passing and delays and there wasn't a joined up approach to it. So my call today uh, is for the Minister to take away the points I've raised uh, and discuss it with his colleagues in DWP, in DCMS, uh, to really drive forward the introduction of such a nationwide service in this country. It is embarrassing that we were one of the first to introduce it, but now we've fallen back over a number of decades and other countries are now way ahead uh, of what we are doing. And I urge him too, and his colleagues too, to look at the evidence, particularly from Australia, 
uh, to see what can be done on a very cost-effective basis. It's not just about money, it is about quality of life too. We owe it to all our constituents uh, to give them as much access to the world of work, the world of public services as anyone else. Um, and I think this is a fairly straightforward way that we could do this. Uh, and I do urge him, I say, to look at the evidence from other countries and to discuss it with his colleagues. Thank you. I'll make five. Thank you, And uh, I want to begin by echoing the tributes to my uh, honourable friend, the member for Poplar and Limehouse, for securing this debate. Now, as we've already heard so far in the debate, there are a number of different dimensions and aspects to deafness. But I want to focus on one particular issue, and that is the criteria for receiving cochlear implants under the NHS. My argument today is simple, that these criteria should be reviewed, it should be made easier to get an implant. To do so would transform the lives of those who need this technology. It would improve the lives of their families and loved ones. And it would be a prudent investment because it would obviate the need for more expenditure further down the line as a consequence of people not receiving the implants that they desperately need. Now let me tell you the story of my constituent Lamina Lloyd. Until last year, Lamina had a flourishing career as the manager of a local citizens' advice bureau. However, Lamina has many years disease, which has resulted in progressive hearing loss, so much so that last year she had to give up work. She has two children who themselves have additional needs. She can no longer hear her children, who have to act as her ears. She describes her family life as having gone from being an outdoor family to one that now rarely leaves the house. Lamina is an intelligent, capable person. But for her, hearing loss has meant the end of her career. It has uh, diminished the quality of her family life and it has resulted in increasing isolation. To try to alleviate her condition, Lamina wears the most powerful hearing aids available, turned up to maximum volume, but they make little difference. They give her frequent ear infections and headaches caused by feedback and the squealing noises from the hearing aids. She can no longer hear music or follow conversations and yet has been in a battle, and that's the only word for it, in a battle for the last two years to try to get a cochlear implant. She falls just short. Five decibels short. That is no more than a whisper of the 90 decibel hearing loss threshold for consideration for an implant. This threshold is one of the strictest in the Western world. It means it is estimated that only 5% of those who could benefit from this technology get access to it here in the United Kingdom. Lamina describes her condition as being too deaf to hear yet not deaf enough to get the help that could make a huge difference to her life. Her hearing has deteriorated even further in recent months, and she now has an appointment at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham in two weeks' time to be assessed. But she and many others in her position have serious reservations about how these assessments are made. The BKB test used uses short sentences in lab conditions. It does not replicate normal conversation or real world conditions. And Lamina and many others feel it is not a tool fit for the purpose of properly measuring hearing ability and hearing loss. And even if Lamina is approved for an implant, the question has to be asked, why is it taking so long? And why do we put people and their families through such pain before giving them the help that could make a life-changing difference? And my honourable friend, the member for Poplar and Limehouse, raised these issues in an adjournment debate earlier this year and briefly at the beginning of his speech today. And he was told earlier this year that NICE was launching a consultation on the guidelines used for this. This has not happened. These guidelines have been in place since 2009, but technology and costs have moved on a great deal 
since then. And can I therefore ask the Minister a few questions to either respond to in answers today, or if that's not possible, I'd be very happy for him to consult with colleagues and write to me and the other members participating after the debate with a more considered response. First, why has the NICE consultation not been launched when it was promised that it would be launched in the summer of this year, and when will it be launched? Secondly, does he agree with me that Lamina's case and the many similar cases around the country show that there is an overwhelming case for revising these criteria? Thirdly, whatever hearing loss threshold is picked, does he agree that the testing of hearing loss needs to be done in real-world conditions that approximate with how people actually live their lives, conduct conversations, and so on. And fourthly, and perhaps most fundamentally, why does it take so long for people to get an implant? Why is this such a battle? The NHS is there for those who need it. It, is, it should not be an organisation that people have to battle with to get the treatment that they need. If my constituent had been helped earlier, she might still be in a job. She wouldn't need to rely on the state for financial support, and our family would not have had to go through the huge difficulties that they've all been through together in the last couple of years. It is time for a step change in the urgency with which this issue of cochlear implants is treated. The guidelines must be revised. The NICE organisation needs to move on this. And it needs to do so soon, so that the suffering of my constituent, Lamina Lloyd, and the many people around the country who are in a similar position can be alleviated. Thank you. Point of order. Point of order, Jim. I do, do apologise. Very brief point of order. I ask my staff to, to monitor the transmission of the, the, the signage. Um, the signage isn't being broadcast. The cameras don't, don't meet them. Um, Westminster Hall debates do not have subtitles, unlike the, the main chamber. Um, obviously, I would very much uh, appreciate if you would take this back to the speaker's um, panel and, uh, and have a discussion about this in due course. Yes, uh, I understand that what's actually happening today is it is being filmed, and when it is rebroadcast, it will actually show in a box, as you would normally see in other TV later. This is obviously an early stage. I will be reporting back on how this whole debate goes at any points that members raise, but I understand the arrangements for today is that when it's rebroadcast, it will show. I'm grateful, Mr McCabe. Kelly Tollhurst. <coughs> Thank you, um, Mr McCabe, and it's a, a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship this afternoon. I want to start by congratulating the Honourable Member for Poplar and Limehouse um, for securing this really important debate and I, it's a real pleasure for me to be able to speak in it. I also wanted to add that I think it's an absolutely fantastic move that today we have uh, si this debate being signed and I would very much advocate that more debates um, yeah. held in the Chamber should be that way. Um, it should be part of the norm of the House of Commons. It shouldn't be... Um, an exception to the rule. Um, I, I was very keen to speak in this debate about deafness and hearing loss, as it has had a major effect on my family. So today, rather than focusing on some of the many issues that, uh, uh, that deaf people in this country are affected by, I wanted to just maybe give you a, a real-life example of how deafness has affected my life. So my mum, at the age of 40... 25 years ago, lost her hearing overnight due to a virus. And when I say overnight, it was literally overnight. She woke up one morning and she couldn't hear anymore. She hadn't been ill, she had never had any hearing problems, but she went from being a hearing person one day to the next day having nothing. My father took my mum to the hospital, and at that time we had a really good uh, ear, nose and throat hospital in Maidstone. And it was about a week later, so it was about a week after she had lost her hearing that she was taken there. And it was confirmed that she had no hearing. They put her on steroids, they told her it was due to a virus, and that the hairs in her ears had died, and that it was probably very unlikely she would ever get her hearing back. This was absolutely devastating for my mother. 
and for all of us, my sister, my, uh, my sister, myself and my dad. It changed her life and our life fundamentally. <coughs> we couldn't communicate with her. Everything had to be written down. My mum couldn't sign, my mum couldn't lip read. So she was flung into isolation and into, to be honest with you, a state of depression. It was a really, really tough time with two, two teenage girls at that particular time who were very much into their singing. And all of a sudden, my mum had to admit that she would never be able to hear her daughters sing again. So because of the abruptness of her hearing loss, it was really difficult to mitigate some of the emotional damage that obviously she had impacted upon her. She was looked after by the NHS. You know, the NHS did try to help her. They gave her lip reading classes. Um, they offered her support with a counsellor. They even offered, there had been another lady in the country who had lost her hearing overnight, like my mother, and they put her in contact with her. But of course, my mum was probably um, uh, mourning the loss of, of, of something that she was never going to get back. But one thing that was qu um, quite Im important, and I I'm, I'm moving on to, and to sort of back up what uh, the Honourable Member for Wolverhampton South East has, has brought up this, this afternoon, is that she was never told that she was a candidate to have a cochlear ear implant. Deafness is the invisible disability. My mum didn't look like she had a disability. Her voice sounded like it always did, as she had been a hearing person for 40 years. But I saw and experienced firsthand the major barriers that people who are deaf have to experience. I recognise that there are strong differences between individuals who have been born deaf or um, have got gradual hear hearing loss or had hearing loss um, as, a, as a small child, maybe due to meningitis um, or, or some other illness. But the biggest thing was my mum didn't have any deaf friends and we didn't actually even know any deaf people. But what was very acute was the opportunities for her were severely limited. My mum had been looked after, my sister and I, at home, and she was looking forward to going back to work because we were in our teens. And, and at that point, she all of a sudden found that she wasn't able to work because she couldn't really um, get the confidence. or well, she, It was very difficult to understand anyone at that particular time. Um, so the, her, the opportunities open to her were extremely, extremely, um, extremely... Uh, limited. But eventually, um, after eight years, my mum did decide uh, that she wanted to do something about her hearing loss and went to the doctors and they talked to her uh, about whether she could be a, a possible candidate for a cochlear ear implant. And it was decided that actually at the time she would have been able to have access to one immediately because of the severity of her hearing loss. It then took another two years for her to get to a situation where she had a cochlear ear implant because obviously the funding at that time, 25 years ago, because obviously they weren't so uh, f uh, frequent as they are now, um, was uh, quite a challenge. Anyway, she had the cochlear ear implant after 10 years of suffering and being isolated, suffering with depression, not being able to go back into work. And uh, sadly for her, the cochlear ear implant, uh, uh, well, after a year of travelling to St Thomas's Hospital um, with the fabulous technicians led by Terry Nunn at St Thomas's, um, decided that it hadn't actually worked, so she had to go back for a further uh, cochlear ear implant. Um, but at this time, and, and many, uh, many people won't understand, is with a cochlear ear implant, it doesn't get your hearing back. You don't hear like you did when you were a hearing person, or, or, um, but it gives you some quality of life. And um, technology has changed 25 years on. Cochlear ear implants aren't just available in London. They're available all over the country. But what we do know, and what was very clear, is that the sooner you have a cochlear ear implant after the loss of your hearing, the greater the impact the cochlear ear implant will have um, and, and the, in how it works and how you're able to hear. Now, 
I, um, I have been extremely worried um, about uh, reading about some of the, some of the um, reports that have been mentioned that some CCGs now are looking at maybe to stop hearing aids. One of the only things that kept my mother going through those 10 years was that she was using a hearing aid, but it didn't help her hearing. All it did was accentuate the background noises and actually cut out some of her tinnitus some of the time. But hearing aids, if she wasn't able to have that access to that service in between that time before having a cochlear ear implant, it would have um, been even worse. So my worry is that if we are looking, in my view, hearing aids are a very, very cheap way of being able to have an impact on people who are suffering from gradual, gradual hearing loss. And I find it quite frightening that CCGs would even be looking at stopping that support. I think it's a dangerous road to go down. And as has already been mentioned by the members <coughs> who have spoken, hearing loss sends you into isolation, even if it's mild hearing loss. You, know, you, you can be in situations where you just will not put yourself in those situations because of the fear of not understanding and not being able to hear what's going on. I used to go into the supermarket with my mother and people would ask her, would she like a carrier bag? And because she didn't hear them, people would just think she was rude or sort of actually make some rude comment to her because they thought she was just being rude, but she actually couldn't hear them. Um, and um, so hearing aids are, are massively important and um, uh, can be a, a, an important way of just keeping people out of that isolation and also that contact with the health service so that their hearing loss can be monitored. Because actually what a lot of people don't talk about is that people who do suffer from hearing loss and deafness are very embarrassed by their disability as well. If, um, if, they were, if their disability was uh, physically physically visible. Everybody would be talking about um, that kind of disability. You would be hearing people banging the drums and asking for support from government and all different organisations for that. But deaf people work and get on with their lives and very rarely moan very much, I have to say. They put up with quite a lot. But because they don't have that visible, um, because they don't have that visible um, characteristics, um, it's very difficult sometimes for us or hearing people to really truly understand the isolation, depression and the mental health sometimes that, the, uh, that these people are subjected to. But I've spoken today very much from an emotional point of view about a real life situation that has affected me. But in conclusion, I hope that <coughs> what I have said has illustrated uh, that deafness can take many different forms. And it is not just through old age or just from birth. And I do believe for too long deaf people have been disadvantaged, isolated. And I do really want to join uh, with the Honourable Member from Poplar and Limehouse and offer my support for the cause of the UK um, Council for Deafness. Um, because it is, it's really good to have this debate and I think all the recommendations in there are, are, are proper recommendations, well thought out, meaningful and uh, realistic asks. Um, and I hope that this debate, um, and if anyone who is deaf uh, listening or watching it hopefully next week, will see that here in Parliament it's really good to have these debates. We do care about uh, deafness in this country and the people that suffer from that. And um, I um, very much am pleased to have been able to speak today. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stephen Lloyd. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Cave. It's a, a, a privilege to serve under your chairmanship. And uh, like the others who have spoken, I'd also like to uh, uh, commend uh, uh, my, the Honourable Member for Popper and, and Limehouse for getting this debate. I, I was the chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group Deafness. I was rudely interrupted in 2015 when something <laughs> else happened. Uh, but it is a pleasure to be back and to serve as Vice-Chair to uh, his excellent chairmanship. Um, I'd also like to commend the previous speakers, both each of whom have spoken uh, uh, importantly on the issue of cochlea. I remember 20, 30 years ago when they first began to uh, uh, really take off and the difference now compared to what it was then is, is absolutely huge. And that overlaps what uh, uh, my other colleague from across the, the chamber talked about with her mother and thank you for that really quite moving 
uh, uh, speech, your mum will be proud of you. I'm absolutely sure of that. Uh, I can relate to a lot of the things that your mum went through. I've been deaf for about 50 years of my life. Um, but uh, cochlear have made a huge difference and their improvement is absolutely massive. So the minister I know is from the Department of Health and an old colleague from Coalition Days, it's good to see him, um, uh, do please exploring how cochlear implants can be ever more available because they do much more now and they do it much earlier. And they are a game changer. When they first came out a oh, long, long time ago, uh, for many years they, they, they were, you know, they, they really didn't make that much a difference. There was vigorous opposition from a lot of the BSL community, which I understand why. Uh, that has changed a great deal over the years. And cochlear implants, actually, I think in many ways, really are the future around transforming deafness. I never really believed it for many uh, in the old days, but now I do because of their advances. I'd like to just cover off a few areas, a couple uh, from the, the UCOD uh, angle and then a couple specifically because we have a health minister <coughs> in the chair. Uh, first off, uh, uh, BSL from UCOD perspective, it, it's, it's a different language. A lot of people, I mean, I'm hard of hearing and I have been with measles since I was six and sometimes people might say to me, Stephen, you're a member of the deaf community and I say, no, I'm a member of the hearing community, I just don't hear very well. And that's an important point because it's completely different. The deaf community is a community. BSL is a completely different community with cultural norms, a different language. BSL is, isn't even a direct translation of my speech. It's different. And, and that's an important point because people sometimes don't understand that. They would say to me, why don't you learn BSL? And I say, because I'm a member of the hearing community, I just don't hear very well and it's a different language. So I'm, I'm very supportive of the BSL, uh, profoundly deaf people, uh, trying to get BSL as a recognised language, as has happened, I believe, in Scotland, in Holyrood. Uh, and I remember, uh, just before 2015, having meetings with uh, a number of people down from Scotland, and we were watching it with great intent. Uh, and one, Because I know that once it happens in one legislative house, then it's very hard for other legislative houses not to follow. So good luck uh, with it up in Scotland because I think that's a game changer and I think eventually it will happen in Westminster. And when it does, it's not just a label, when uh, a nation says that a language is a statutory language, the important thing about that is it means it's accessible. It means public bodies have to provide uh, uh, information in that language, and that will make a huge difference for a lot of profoundly deaf people. And I'll tell you why, and I'll give you one very good example. Uh, I mean, I've been involved for many, many years in politics uh, around deafness as a trustee of this and patron of that or what have you, and I know uh, or knew a lot of people uh, uh, who are profoundly deaf and, and working in that area, including from the British uh, Deaf Association. I just came from a statement this morning when the uh, Secretary of State for the DWP uh, in his statement mentioned around about 50% of disabled people are out of work. Well, I can tell you what, it's a hell of a lot higher than that if you're profoundly deaf. I haven't got the figures because no one really finds them because the DWP used to drive me crazy when I see it before, wouldn't slice uh, the different disabilities up. They'd just say problems with deafness, problems with, with, with visual impairment, which completely denies the separateness of deafness. I would say off the bat that profoundly deaf people, you're looking at an unemployment rate of around 70%. And that is ridiculous. That is just ridiculous. How can you possibly take out whatever it is, 100,000 people, if not more, of adult working age and have the barriers as such that 70% is unemployed? It's a blooming outrage, it really is. And, and uh, now I'm back at, at the house, tremendous. Wonderful for the people of Eastbourne, or thank you for the people of Eastbourne. I'm very determined to lobby hard on BSL becoming an accepted uh, language. I'm also uh, very keen to join my colleague from Popper and Limehouse on lobbying around access to work. It is actually a great thing that government have done. I think it was John Majors originally, to be honest. Uh, access to work is a good thing. It's made a huge difference to a lot of people. Uh, and so I'm a big, big supporter. The challenge with it in many ways is it's made a great difference for people who are in work 
and uh, uh, acquire a disability, either through illness or, or a catastrophic incident or what have you. And it's been fantastic in helping people stay in work. Uh, what I would like to see is access to work to be even more improved, particularly for the SME sector, so that they understand that they can employ people with disabilities because access to work provides a lot of the money uh, that will give an induction loop, will put a ramp in, do whatever is, is often necessary um, uh, to, help a to help an employer take on a disabled person. And that's really important because corporates kind of get it because they're big and they're huge and they have massive HR departments and pots of money and so they try to do their best. It's much harder if you're an SME. It's hard if you're employing three people. You know, and I'm the director of being a plumber or whatever and I work seven days a week and someone comes to see me and they've got a disability, it's just so much easier for folks to say, no, no, sorry, find an excuse, I'm not going to employ you. Well, in fact, access to work uh, will often provide that money that will allow that SME to take on that disabled person. I'll let the house into a vast secret and I say this with authority because I used to be a consultant in this area for years. You employ disabled people, you get lower churn. I've seen that, I've seen that in call centres, I've seen that in businesses, I've seen it in numerous different areas. And I used to be very involved with the SF, FSB, and I'm sure I will be again, now I'm back. Uh, uh, lower churn is really important when you're, a lot of your money, a lot of your spend is going uh, on employment and employing people. At a later date, I'll explain why you get lower churn, but you do. So access to work is something that... Yes, sir, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much for, to, to my honourable uh, friend for giving way. Um, would he agree with me that one of the issues, are you talking about SMEs and, and some of the challenges actually for them in employing uh, people with such uh, impairment, that uh, it is also an issue where so many people um, who do suffer with deafness or, or hearing, uh, uh, failing hearing, to actually uh, progress within an organisation because of the cap and that they, it actually sort of is almost itself enforcing in terms of people then being pressed into part-time working. Uh, I appreciate uh, the intervention. Thank you for that. It's a very good example. I've got no hearing on my left, so I couldn't hear you. Thank you for that. Jim knows to punch me. Uh, uh, you're actually right. There are elements around access to work. As it's expanded, and it costs a lot more money over the years, uh, government, and, and I'm not chucking stones, I know how challenging it is within the budget envelope, uh, have introduced more and more caps. What I would like to see the DWP, and the Minister can go back and, and tell his colleagues, is rather than focusing on the different caps around, uh, or, or, or the different ways you can cap access to work, focus on some better and more creative ways we can use the money. Because I am convinced, and I know this just from years of experience, colleagues will have to take my... Uh, uh, take my word for it, that uh, uh, where, in the majority of times where disabled people get into a job, where properly managed, you know, etc., and with proper support, they will stay there for years. And that is so much, that costs so much less money than actually having to constantly re-employ. So thank you for the intervention. I'll just move on to two key areas that are specific to my, uh, to the Honourable Minister's whatever's brief, health, right. Uh, one of the things that I fought very hard for last time, so I'm going to do it now as your help, was to get, um, whenever someone hit pension age, that they would automatically be invited uh, for a hearing aid screening. So it would be 65, 66, whatever. Or I think under the coalition, I think retirement age is 150 now, but anyway, I think 66. Uh, and now the reason that's significant is... Something like 50 or so percent of people, heading up to 60 percent uh, as you get older, over the age of 60 and 65, begin to get age onset hearing loss. Mine is an age onset, though I'm old enough now. It's measles, as I said. Uh, Jim's far too young, so it can't possibly be uh, age onset. Uh, but the thing is with hearing loss is that the vast majority of people ignore it for 15 years. Because hearing loss is not a sexy disability. My colleague from Kent flagged that, and it's so true. It's not a, a sexy disability. And you start losing your hearing. You don't admit to it. Your husband's and wife go potty. The volume's turned up massively on the, the television. And eventually, your kids drag you to the audiology department, if it's still open. Come to that. 
the audiology department in your mid-70s. And the problem with that, and there's significant data to prove this, which I'll be happily to share with the minister another time, is the longer you take to get a hearing aid, the less chance of it working. Because the difference between a 75-year-old and a 65-year-old in acuity terms is enormous. And hearing loss uh, is not like glasses. I can't see properly. I put glasses on. I have 20-20 vision. Hearing aids, they do not replace lost sound. All they do is amplify your residual hearing. Try and explain that for colleagues very quickly. Imagine a radio uh, battery is running down. You turn the volume up. You get a lot more sound, but it's very discordant. That's what hearing aids do. And anyway, I was uh, pressing very hard for the NHS, uh, for the Department of Health to run a pilot um, uh, just for all pensioners when they get to, to pensionable age to receive an invite to audiology or wherever. It could be a pharmacy for that matter, have a hearing test. My rationale behind that, which was supported by pretty much every group, including uh, NICE, that you can possibly imagine, was that you get in early, you're forced to accept you're losing your hearing. You get a hearing aid, ipso facto, it's much easier to get used to. My view, shared by many others, would be a huge uh, advantage, not least on even reducing the levels of dementia, because we've discovered dementia is li linked to social isolation. If you're old and you're deaf and you're hard of hearing, uh, you isolate. Um, uh, the, the Department of Health at the time agreed in principle that they would run a pilot. It took me a long time because they didn't want to do it because they know I'm right because it's going to cost a lot more money, all these extra hearing aids. Uh, uh, and they agreed to run a pilot and then there was a tragedy, colleagues. I lost the election. <laughs> and as soon as I lost, boom. You know, I wasn't there to nag like hell and it sort of disappeared uh, uh, off the back burner. However, uh, I'm delighted to see my uh, old colleague uh, for MP for Winchester is now the minister, so I'm, I'm sure that I put that on the table. He will move heaven and earth uh, to rusticate that and do a pilot. It will make a huge difference to hundreds of thousands of people, and I'm deadly serious. So I would encourage that. On audiology, it's easy to cut hearing aids, because it's mostly old people. They're not going to be organised. They're not going to complain like hell. They're isolated anyway, because I've already said they're in their mid-70s by the time they go to audiology department. So I'm really pretty angry that a lot of CCGs are getting away with beginning to trim audiology services because there aren't enough people fighting their corner. Uh, well, I would urge again the minister, I know that CCGs are independent, but uh, he and I also know that there are protocols. And uh, I would, would ask that the minister and his response uh, uh, makes a commitment that CCGs will be told uh, just how important audiology is, just how important hearing aids are, and they must not use it, uh, the, the austerity challenges they face, they must not use it to, to cut <coughs> audiology. Uh, and on that note, I'd like again to thank the uh, Honourable Member for Popper and Limehouse for securing this debate. Thank you. These are all those. Thank you very much, Mr McCabe. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and I congratulate my honourable friend the member for Poplar and Limehouse for securing this debate and indeed some colleagues who have spoken very movingly about their own personal experiences. Um, I welcome, it's great to see my honourable friend the member from Winchester in his place as the responding minister and I'm sure he would do this ably but I think it's an, an indication of a sort of challenge the hard of hearing the deaf community face in that certainly during the course of this debate I've heard five different departments who have got a particular issue that needs to be, to be addressed. That's the Department of Health, Department of Education, Bayes, Department of Communities, Media and Sport and also the DWP. And so I think that does perhaps show there is a danger working in departmental silos that some of the challenges that we're hearing about today are not getting properly addressed. Um, my honourable friend, the member for Poplar and Limehouse, is very much a champion for the, de for the deaf and hard of hearing community. And I'm going to briefly highlight the work of another such champion, Anne Gillings from Lowstoft, who is working with passion and determination to secure the best possible education for her son, Daniel, and in doing so, is campaigning for other parents of deaf children in North Suffolk. Daniel started at Bungie High School in September. 
He is doing well, and there is a good package of support in place for him. But Anne had to fight very hard to get that, and she continues to campaign for a hearing-impaired unit in North Suffolk. It's clear that not just in Suffolk, but across the country, deaf children are not getting the right support right from the start, and thus they are not always able to realise their full potential at school. This can then put them at a considerable disadvantage for the rest of their lives. What we need to do is to break down these barriers and put in place a properly funded national framework within which local education authorities like Suffolk County Council can provide a good education and support service locally and if they don't do so, they can then be held to account. Mr McCabe, the National Deaf Children's Society, who do great work campaigning for deaf children to have the same opportunities as everyone else, have highlighted four issues on which government action is needed to break down the barriers that deaf children face. Firstly, as it's appropriate, there's a need for NHS England to improve the quality of children's hearing services. The National Deaf Children's Society have highlighted in their Listen Up campaign that across the country, many such services have significant shortcomings and are failing to meet the necessary standards in audiology. The quality assurance process that was previously in place has ended and it's not been replaced by any other mandatory process. The, ND, the NDCS have a three-point action plan to address this particular problem. Firstly, NHS England must ensure that children's audiology services, that those services they directly commission, such as to the under fives, they should ensure that they comply with the, with the improving quality and physiological services, that's IKIP, IPIPS accreditation programme. Secondly, it is vitally important that this programme is more transparent so that families know whether their services are good quality or, whether, or if they need to be improved. And thirdly, it is necessary for the accreditation process to be compulsory so that all paediatric audiology services are moving towards running a good quality operation. My second point is, relates to access to hearing radio aids technology for deaf children. Radio aids have a vitally important role to play in helping deaf children hear speech. They enable, enable children to better understand their teacher. They also have a big impact in improving parent-child communication. Despite these obvious benefits, most local authorities do not currently make radio aids available for use by families in the home. The NDCS are calling on local authorities and the Department for Education to ensure that every child who could benefit from a radio aid is given access to one at the earliest possible opportunity. To do this, the Department for Education should encourage local authorities to make use of their special provision capital fund to provide radio aids where they are needed. The third point relates to a British Sign, Langu British Sign Language and the need for GCSE in British Sign Language. Mr McCabe, a campaign which the government really must listen to is the Right to Sign campaign for British Sign Language to be available as a GCSE that can be taught in schools. As Anne Gillings has points out, it is the first language of deaf children. It is discriminatory that deaf children do not have the opportunity to achieve what is probably the widest recognised qualification, and it is given a lower status than other languages. There are other accredited British Sign Language. There are, the there are the accredited qualifications in British Sign Language, but these are not widely available to children in schools and are less likely to be recognised by employers. Daniel Gillings achieved his BSL Level 1 three years ago, but it was not funded. Anne tutored him and paid for all the assessments herself. There is a compelling case for a GCSE in BSL in terms of equality, denial of choice for deaf children, and, pl and it places an unnecessary barrier to further and higher education and thereafter entering the workplace. This barrier must be removed. 
A GCSE has already been piloted and is largely ready to go. The Department for Education must make an exception to their blanket policy of not allowing any new GCSEs to be developed. The fourth point and final point I have relates to the Special Educational Needs and Disabilities Framework. The Children and Families Act of 2014 made significant changes to the Special Educational Needs and Disabilities, that's the SEND framework. One of the key changes was to replace SEN statements with education, health and care plans, EHC plans. The deadline for implementing these changes is April of next year, and there is a concern that many schools and local education authorities are, stu are struggling to, meet, to implement these changes in time. In Suffolk, Ofsted and the CQC identified weaknesses in the county council's practices in meeting this requirement of the Act. To ensure that authorities like Suffolk are able to meet their obligations, they must be provided with sufficient funding. Whilst the high needs block, which funds SEN support, has been protected in cash firms terms, it has not been adjusted to reflect a variety of additional challenges. That's the rising number of children and young people requiring additional support, the greater local authority responsibility for young children with SEND, aged between 16 and 25, and also in early years, and also a trend towards more children being placed in special schools. Mr McCabe, more money needs to be made available, and Ofsted need, need to review how it can strengthen the accountability framework around SEN and, D and how it inspects schools. In conclusion... Anne Gillings has gone that extra mile and works tirelessly to ensure that Daniel gets the opportunity to have the best possible start in life, to have the best possible education, so that he can realise his full potential. There are many barriers that have been placed in, in, in her way in pursuit of this goal. I would suggest that it is our duty, it is the duty of government, and it is the duty of local authorities to remove these barriers as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, Kerry McCarthy. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see you in the chair, as always. And I thank my honourable friend, the member for Poplar and Limehouse, for securing this important debate. I think the contributions we've had so far have been fantastic. There are two issues in particular that affect deaf and hard of hearing people that I wish to raise today. The first is accreditation of children's hearing services, and the second is the cap on the access to work scheme grants, which have already been um, spoken about. There are over 50,000 deaf children across the UK, and an estimated 794 deaf children in the Bristol area alone. For these children, high quality audiology services to carry out tests, fit and maintain hearing aids and provide rehabilitative support are vital. Despite this, the government has stopped mandatory inspection of services, instead replacing them with the Improving Quality in Physiological Services, IQIPS accreditation programme. And since this voluntary programme started in 2012, only 15% of children's audiology services have achieved IQIPS accreditation. So that means that 85% cannot guarantee that their service is of good quality. And I would say that this lack of transparency is unacceptable. It's leaving far too many families in the dark about the quality of their ch child's audiology service. And obviously, it's of immense importance to parents that their children do get access to good services. Some have stepped up to the starting blocks by signing up to the scheme, such as St Michael's Hospital in Bristol, which serves my constituents. And a few are nearing the finish line and accreditation but too many are not taking part at all. The National Deaf Children's Society, through its Listen Up campaign, is calling on the government and NHS England to make assessment of children's audiology services mandatory and for information from these assessments to be publicly available. And I support this campaign. And I implore the government and NHS England to implement changes which will help ensure that deaf children get the quality of service they deserve. It can make so much difference to their future life chances. The second issue, as I said, is about the cap on access to work grants. The access to work scheme, as we've already heard from the Honourable Member for Poplar and Limehouse, enables many disabled people to overcome work-related obstacles through practical advice, support and grants towards extra employment costs that cannot be met by employers as reasonable adjustments. 
a review some time ago, but 2004 government review suggested that for every £1 of money spent on access to work, £1.48 was generated for the Treasury. I'm deeply concerned about the effect that the cap on access to work grants for new claimants imposed by the Department for Work and Pensions in 2015 will have on the career prospects of deaf and hard of hearing employees. For existing claimants, this cap is due to come into force in April next year. The cap is one and a half times the national average salary, currently £42,100 per year. So, sorry, that's, that's what the cap is set at. And why this may be enough support for some people, for others it is not. Take, for instance, someone who contacted me about today's debate, who is deaf, a constituent of mine, who uses British Sign Language and works as a disability advisor at an educational establishment. Access to work helps him participate fully and equally at work by paying the costs of communication support with, namely, British Sign Language interpreters. And this support is inevitably expensive. You're paying people's wages, which is why it's unlikely to be classed as a reasonable adjustment for his employer. At the moment, he's able to access the support of these interpreters throughout his working week. The cap means that at most he would be able to book interpreters for three days a week, leaving him with two days when he wouldn't be able to communicate with his colleagues and clients, meaning he would be unable to do his job effectively. Access to work, Mr McCabe, revolutionised the career opportunities of <coughs> deaf people, shattering the glass ceiling that had previously limited them to manual jobs. It has largely been due to access to work that deaf people have progressed as far as their talent allows. There are now deaf CEOs, deaf intermediaries working at the Ministry of Justice, deaf theatre directors, deaf social workers. Yet research conducted earlier this year by Deaf ATW found that the cap on access to work grants is already having a detrimental effect on the deaf community. And we've heard the figures from my honourable friend. On behalf of my constituent and all those in the deaf community have benefited or stand to benefit from this scheme, I do implore the Minister today to listen to what is being said and to remove or raise the access to work cap and once again lift the ceiling on the career aspirations of those who are deaf or hard of hearing. Penning. To serve under your chairmanship this evening, or this afternoon, it's going to be this evening soon, and it's a pleasure uh, to also be on the debate uh, uh, secured by my very good friend, the member for Popular and Limehouse. We've been on many campaigns together over the years, not least in our previous careers. At the outset, Mr McCabe, I need to declare an interest. I am the honorary patron of the Hertfordshire he Hearing Advisory Service and have been for uh, over 10 years. They're a fantastic charity that do work not only in Hertfordshire, but across many different counties. And it's very difficult to disagree with hardly anything that we've heard in the chamber. And it's a really positive debate. And I think the, the People that are seeing this debate and others will realise that this House can work together for not just people of hard of hearing, but people of hard of hearing and other issues. And one of the things we've not discussed in this debate is very often people that are hard of hearing or deaf have other ailments, and sometimes that is, is as difficult for them as, as they're being hard of hearing. Mr. McGowan, the other thing that um, ministers usually, and I can assure you from experience, don't like is for a former minister to be standing up in a debate to talk about something that they might know something about. So I was, for a short time, the disability minister and responsible for access to work. So let me, if I can, be positive about it and also say this breaks some of the taboos about this. Access to work, as we've heard, is one of the great schemes for people across this great nation of ours that had been left behind, ignored, told that they couldn't work, Employers told them that they couldn't employ them. It wasn't safe to employ them. And as we've heard, that was complete and utter rubbish. And I don't have to believe the Honourable Gentleman, if you take his word for it, because the evidence is there within the Department of Work and Pensions that people that have disabilities work harder, are more likely to turn up for work, they're more dedicated and more committed than any other of their employees. That's a fact. We know that. And when I went round the country doing the disability confident, trying to encourage employers to take on people with all types of disabilities, that was pretty easy, as we've heard, with the bigger companies. And there are some fantastic large companies out there, and particularly the Royal Mail, can I say, who get biffed around a little bit sometimes in this house. But their commitment to people that either arrive with disabilities or then gain disabilities while they're in employed there is simply fantastic. But it is really hard with the SMEs. And there's this myth about that, you know, there's the risk. You know, 
health and safety prevents me. Well, I was a health and safety minister as well, so I was happy to go around and dismiss that. But we have to work really hard with um, the SMEs. And access to work fantastically helped thousands and thousands of people get into work and have that confidence to stay. And the cap was in, brought in just before I became the minister, and one of the first things I said is, where is the evidence base? Where is the evidence base that the department has that we need to do this and whether the cap will work? So there is evidence in the department. I say this on the record. They know exactly, and it's continually reviewed. One of, one of the things that you're taught as a minister when you stand at this back box is you always say, the government continues to keep under review this, that, or whatever. And I can assure you the department keeps under the review, and it's really a shame that you know, uh, my friend here, for, uh, who's my, what's my PPS, is responsible for this, but I say this to the DWP that will be seeing the record for this. They know where it's going to work, they are keeping it under review, and they need to be open and honest as to how, it, how it's working. And if it's not working, then it needs to be adjusted. Because for me, as a former minister, I'm not going to have all that great work lost, all those peaceful as people's aspirations and commitment to work being lost because of a cap, which actually in real terms doesn't save a huge amount of the money. I give way to my honourable friend. So it makes the same points as I think we've all made. It is a great scheme. It does work. Um, as I understand it, the logic is there is only so much money in the pot, and obviously that's always the case for government, and therefore the cap is to try and spread that which is available as yep. widely as possible. But those people who do have fantastic talent, who could be advocates and champion for the deaf community by becoming chief executives and leaders of their professions, etc., they have that glass ceiling reinforced because they can only get from today, £43,000. So it, it's not a criticism. Well, it is a criticism in some <laughs> respects, but it's a, it's a criticism to say we need to make sure that the evidence is being looked at regularly. And, and you know, governments need to be kicked and beaten up at times when they get things wrong, and they need to be praised when they got things right. And I was very proud that a Conservative government brought this in. I think it was massively, massively important. And for, And... If that evidence doesn't show that this is going to work, and there will always be examples of, you know, the, the, you know, there was an abuse within the system and things like that, but that mustn't be an excuse to have a carte blanche look and say, no, this is the only way this can work is with a cap. So I say to the minister, um, who, as I say, went and looked twice as when he went, came in and realised what most of this debate would be about, which is not actually his portfolio, but actually a DWP portfolio in this particular area. Now, I'm more than happy to go across to my old department and sit with my old officials and explain to them exactly where the evidence must be within their, in their cupboards. Can I also, Ms McCabe, just touch on two other areas briefly and then one area which hasn't been touched on at all um, in my closing remarks? I do not understand in the 21st century, which is a language which is recognised, is not recognised in this house and across the country. I, I really don't understand why all these years after I stood in the chamber in 2005 did a point of order complaining that there wasn't a hearing loop available for my constituents when they were in the house, and even when it was installed it didn't work very properly. This is the first time in a debate that we've had uh, signing for our constituents. I think this is something. And there will all be people going on about be, it, it must cost more money. The cost is minimal compared to the benefit that would happen to our constituents being part of the democratic process, which is what we're in, of course. Very brief, because I have others to, to, to talk. Uh, I'd like to thank the Honourable Friend for kicking off about the induction loop years ago, because I can tell you I couldn't function as an MP in the chamber without the induction loop. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Things I do for everybody in, 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 in this house. But it was, it was genuinely embarrassing. I, I remember vividly, and I won't say anything about it, I don't remember that I said something from a sedentary position, which was And I said to the Speaker, then Michael Martin, my constituents have come to see this World Heritage Site and see their parliament at work. And I took them on a tour around. And frankly, they didn't get hardly any benefit apart from visual because they couldn't understand or hear a word I was saying. Well, there was a comment from a set of tripositions where, well, they didn't miss very much, I think. But the point that I was trying to get across is that, you know, the mother of parliaments, and as we've heard from my colleagues earlier on, you know, we're way behind the loop again now. And I'm sorry to use... <laughs> Terrible pun, but we are really behind it. And for 
I hope this is a lurch forward we're going to have, and I know sort of clerks have been coming in and the speaker's going to get reported to and all that. Great. That's absolutely useless unless someone actually does something and then we move on. And this should be live transmitted. And I know this is a trial, but this should be actually live. Secondly, and very short um, and very briefly, there should be a GCSE. I, I just find it absolutely fascinating. If you look at the different courses and the different things that our young people do within schools and colleges and for them to be excluded in this way. I mean, there must be something, if they don't want to extend it anymore, they don't want any more GCSEs, well, we can drop one of the ones which doesn't actually get used anywhere near as much as what this would get used. And to make people, and the one thing that's been said to me in my own constituency, if people that are not deaf and hard of hearing want to be able to communicate, so they want to do these courses as well. They want to have a GCSE because they can chat away with their mates in that sort of way. So I think that's a simple thing. I can't see where there's huge cost in, in, implications in doing that. And so that should be moved on, as this, we've heard this afternoon. Can I just touch at the end, Ms McKay, on people whose hearing has been impaired by industrial injuries? It's not been mentioned at all during the debate, not only because people don't believe that they should do it. I just think it's one of those, one of those issues that because it's not, people can't see that you've got an industrial injury. It's not like so many industrial injuries that I, you know, I've seen when, in my former job as a fireman, like the, my honourable friend did as well. But there is something really very wrong about how we measure industrial injuries, and in particular, hearing impairment industrial injuries. We've already heard so many people who have hearing impairment don't admit it to themselves, don't admit it to their wives and their loved ones, even though they're probably their lives and their wives are more aware that there's an issue going on, but certainly don't talk about it to their employer or their previous employers. And I can talk about this in a way because my uh, eardrum is perforated. I didn't know about that until I started to miss the conversations that I thought I should be picking up and you continue asking. You just don't think there's something wrong. But when I went to the MOD as the minister, I had to have a medical before I was allowed to go away into operational fields and it was plainly obvious that my, I had a perforated eardrum, which was not picked up when I left the armed forces, but almost certainly was while I was in the armed forces from live firing. It's, if you, the specialist told me that's what it would be. Now, that, that's not important so much to me, but it is massively important that there is also a level playing field out there for the, dis, uh, the uh, disabled, disabled levels for when industrial injuries are common. There is a completely different level, for instance, for hearing damage in the armed forces than it is in what I call civvy street. That can't be right. We must encourage people to come forward, not just so much that they get the compensation. As we've heard earlier on, if we can pick this up earlier, it saves the state and it saves everybody a lot of money, but also makes life much better for that person who then starts to accept the disability that they have and they can continue to live a happy life with. I'll give away. Forgive me. When, when I had my hearing test and identified my um, audiological loss, um, and the printout, as, as he would know, they can tell whether it's, ge uh, whether it's just out to age, or genetic, whether it's industrial. And mine was down to at least partly industrial. Yeah. And I was told by my clinicians, your hearing loss is above the threshold for applying for industrial injury uh, benefit compensation. I never did, because no. I had a great job here. I didn't have to. I mean, it wasn't a matter of the money. Um, it's always, I've always felt a bit difficult saying, well, I should have gone down as a statistic, because I'm sure, as he's describing, there are a lot of us out here who haven't registered and don't appear in the statistics, and the, the base statistics that we have are just the people who absolutely need to go and make sure that they are registered. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I don't think Mrs. McKay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt. Um, <laughs> I did have a double take very quickly. But I, I, I think my friend, on my friend has absolutely hit it on the head. This is not just about the money, though. Getting people in as we heard earlier on, whether it's at a pensionable age or when they leave a, an employer or where they leave the armed forces, is absolutely violent. My hearing was not tested when I left the armed forces. Supposed to have done, but wasn't. And if anybody can find a record when it was, then I can take, take them on about that. What, we're trying to, what I'm trying to raise is not whether they're entitled to compensation, that's someone else's decision. But they're not entitled to compensation unless we get them tested. And if we can get them tested, then they relatively know, the specialist, as my own friend said, what type of 
what called the causal effect of the start of the deafness will be. And there's a myriad of different reasons, but actually industrial damage is pretty well defined. So for me here today, one, I'm thrilled there's so many people here on a Thursday afternoon when that the, the other chamber has probably got half, if not less than half, of the amount of people we've got in here now. And perhaps, uh, Ms. Buck, um, my honourable friend and I might go back to the business, uh, back by business committee, and we'll have a property debate on the floor of the house on some of the specifics of what we've discussed today. And if necessary, that should be on access, access to work, because that is a life changer and has been for many people, and we mustn't lose that life changing ability. Yeah. Tommy Shepherd. Uh, thank you, Ms. Buck. Today I will talk to you about deafness and hearing loss in Scotland. I'll come back to my poor attempt at that later. I, I wanted to uh, speak about a number of things, much of which has already been said, but I also welcome very much and congratulate uh, my honourable friend for bringing the debate here today and indeed commend him for the work that he's done through the APPG on raising this issue across the House. Um, I, uh, th there are approximately one million people in Scotland who suffer uh, hearing loss, uh, and I am one of them. Uh, about 15 years ago, I began to find that my hearing was deteriorating, uh, and I didn't do much about it. I was just very irritating with my friends and family, uh, uh, not, not hearing things. Uh, but eventually I, I was persuaded to go and, and, uh, and get some treatment. And I was diagnosed and I've got a problem uh, of degeneration in the inner ear, uh, which is a uh, 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 an inherited uh, trait that, I, that I've got. It means, that, it means that I can't hear some frequencies, but I can hear others. So some frequencies I hear at full volume, others I hear at just 30 or 40 percent. And that means that I lose a lot of the sense of what people are uh, saying to me. And I am beyond uh, gratitude for, the, for NHS Lothian and our public health service and what they have been able to do for me. I wear hearing aids like uh, my honourable friend too. And they are, they, I mean, the degree of technology and sophistication in these little things is really quite remarkable. The, there are, these are many computers in here that take in all frequencies and decide to boost the ones that I am weak on. And it means that I can, by and large, uh, hear relatively normally. Having said, and, and I also want to place on record um, the efforts of the, of the House authorities, in particular the, the loop in the chamber, I find very, very effective indeed. Of course, there are still drawbacks. Uh, I mean, uh, and, and uh, those who, uh, like me, wear hearing aids will be aware of this uh, as well. Uh, I mean, for example, when, I, when I'm in the chamber taking part in the debate and I have the setting for, on for the loop, if somebody, if a colleague says something beside, sitting beside me, I, I, I don't get it. I have to actually reprogram the aid and try and, uh, and, and, and find out what they're saying or, or just nod and pretend I've got the gist of what they were saying to me, which happens quite often uh, as well. And of course, with these ones, uh, I, I notice they can be irritating to me and to other people in close proximity with the degree of feedback you sometimes get and the, uh, the whistling sound. But uh, it's worth putting up uh, with these uh, minor drawbacks, I think, to be able to take advantage of this great technology. And as I say, I have got these on the NHS, and I am in very, very grateful indeed to receive them. I think these instruments I have, I know they're state-of-the-art uh, technology, and they, are, they match anything that's available in the private sector. And I, in fact, I, I have some friends who either for, through inclination or ignorance, have decided to go private to, to some of the agencies in the high street that try and retail hearing aids, and they've got a service which is far inferior to mine, and eventually, on my advice, they go to the local audiology department and get uh, better treatment. So uh, that's uh, just something of why I have a, a particular interest in this debate. But of course, I'm mindful also that this is probably one of the most common disabilities we as a species suffer. Uh, there's probably more of my constituents who suffer hearing loss than actually voted for me on June the 8th. That's how prevalent uh, the, the, the situation is. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and therefore, I, I, wanted, um, I wanted just to uh, spend a little time, because others have mentioned it, talking about uh, the situation in Scotland, particularly with regard uh, to BSL. Uh, you would see from... Uh, though any, anyone... BSL users watching what I did at the beginning will understand that I, I, I cannot sign, but I tried uh, to learn uh, that opening line uh, because I know uh, as time goes on I will want to learn BSL and I will be something that I rely upon in later years. 
therefore, it's very important to me, but it's important to me in the here and now because of so many people for whom that is a vital means of communication. Uh, now, it's been referred to already that the, uh, in 2015, the Scottish Parliament passed the BSL uh, Scotland Act. It did so uh, through an initiative from an individual MSP who decided to bring this to the Parliament. Uh, in fact, not one of mine, a Labour uh, MSP, and it was passed uh, with every party, all five parties in full agreement. It was passed unanimously. Uh, and one of the key things that that Act did was to launch a process to establish a national action plan to promote and develop BSL in Scotland with the simple objective of making Scotland the best place in the world to be a BSL user and to live and work and play. That was the simple objective. And I say this, colleagues, not to blow Scotland's trumpet, although it is part of my brief to do that, and not to say that you know, Scotland is better than the rest of the UK, but simply to say that if you take the time and sit down and talk about these things and draw a plan, you'd be surprised at just how much can be done. And I do ask the minister and, and, and ask the government to look at the situation now that's developing in Scotland and maybe see how much of that could be replicated on a UK-wide basis. The national plan was published in, in, uh, in, in September. It's uh, quite detailed, 70 targets. I'm not going to go into them all. It's available in the Scottish government website. But before I mention some of the individual targets, see, I think what's, what's really important about this was the process. Because once you actually provide the time in a parliament for a discussion that leads to legislation, and you have got the statutory force of these discussions taking place, things begin to go on the agenda and come out of the woodwork that you never thought about. And it's a stimulus to all manner of, of you know, people in, in civic society and in government agencies to think about how they can actually improve the situation. So there are 70 detailed targets set here for the next three years. I mean, just to give you a, a flavour of them, the very first one, by the way, is, is, is to look at how we can build into the 2021 census a question or a series of questions which identify in detail the number of BSL users that are taking part in that census so that we have the data on which to plan in the future. Uh, number Target 10 talks about um, early years, improvement in the early years of service to make sure that uh, young uh, children of BSL users, young deaf children, have got access to those services. Um, 16 talks about removing the barriers uh, for BSL users to become teachers, not just to teach in the medium of BSL, but to teach through interpretation, hearing kids as well. Uh, 25 talks about targets on our colleges and universities, and the next target actually very important, it makes loans available for BSL students. And I'm very pleased to say that this, just this week, the Scottish Government announced that those loans will be available for students in Scotland to study throughout the UK if the course is not available in Scotland. So we now have a situation where we can support BSL users who are students uh, in Scotland, but uh, able to go to courses in England and, and Wales as well. Um, the uh, page, uh, target 39 is about health, it's about making sure that all of our health screening programs and our immunisation programs have got the medium of BSL built into them so that BSL users have full access to that. Um, 48 is about sport. Uh, 53 is about placing obligations on transport providers, on our rail and bus providers, to make sure that they understand the needs of BSL users and have that available uh, as a means of communication. Um, 57 is about access to the arts. Target 63 is about making sure our fire and emergency services and our police service understand the, uh, the, the, the needs of BSL users and, use, uh, able, and have a facility to be able to uh, communicate with them on that basis. And finally, uh, the last one I'd pick out is that there's a target in there as well to actually improve electoral participation, improve voting by BSL users in the, in the political process. So a series of you know, very good targets, but probably the, the best thing about them is the, is the way in which BSL users themselves have bought into the process and have become part of developing this action plan. And a full £1.3 million has been provided to a, a, a number of deaf voluntary organisations to monitor how these targets uh, develop and how they are implemented. And then in 2020, the intention is to come back with a full government review against across all agencies uh, to make sure that we look at the next stage. So these are, these are practical, achievable steps that can be taken many of which don't involve a lot of money. They actually can be done within existing budgets. They require changes in attitudes. So I think 
I mean, again, just to say the importance of having a statutory framework and setting all these things down as targets for government agencies and, and, and giving it that statutory force cannot be underestimated. And I know, you know, I know time, there's always pressure on the legislative programme, but it's to, to have a, a UK BSL Act that would do some of these things uh, wouldn't take a lot of parliamentary time. It needn't be a very complicated bill. It could be focused upon, and I think, you know, that even if we have to give up in a... a three hours, uh, you know, a backbench debate or two in order to get this through, I think it would be something worth doing. And I'm sure if the government were to take an initiative, uh, they would find all parties uh, commending them and being part of it. Yeah. Uh, finally, I wanted to talk about the situation of, of <coughs> access uh, to work as well. Um, a number of people have raised this, but I think it's important to stress that we now have a situation coming where, of course, existing claimants who were part of the, uh, the benefit of the programme, who weren't limited until now, it was new claimants that were the cap applied, but now existing claimants are going to be subject to that cap as well. And that is going to mean that some people uh, so who are in employment at the minute are going to have to reduce their employment or leave their employment altogether. That's the truth of the matter. It may not be a great number of people, but that's what's going to happen. And I note that the DWP themselves say that only about 200, 267, I think, is the number of people they estimate will be affected by the cap. I mean, I have to say to colleagues, that's not a great number of people. And this really does look like penny pinching when you compare this to the scale of the DWP budget. Sorry, you are happy to give way? I'm grateful to my uh, to honourable gentleman and friend for, for, for giving way. The early statistics were saying that for every pound spent on access to work, the Treasury was actually getting um, a cost benefit analysis plus, which was £1.34, £1.50. And of course, a lot of the people that he's describing are senior professionals, chief executives, etc. They'd be on 40% tax. So it's an investment which actually will give the Treasury more money back than just the basic. I, I, I couldn't agree more because you, if, if you've got somebody in work and getting the support through the scheme, that not only are they earning money and paying tax, but the people who are supporting them are earning money and paying tax as well. So, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which this makes sense. But my, my key point is that given the small number of people who are affected, you know, is this really worth it? Would it not be better just not to have the cap and then assess the situation later on? Because I, I say this, I mean, look, the reason why it's expensive is because the nature of the of, of, of the support that people need in, in this part of the programme, if you are deaf and a BSL user, it is expensive, you know, and it's expensive because it's undertaken by hard-working professional people like these who have trained very hard to, uh, for, for, for the, the job that they do. Now, it might be that at some stage in the future that developments in audio technology and computer graphics will be such that we'll, we'll get an app on our smartphone that will turn speech into sign in a, a way that works. Who knows? But that's for the future. For now, we need professional human beings to be able to provide this service. And I think we should accept as a society that for the limited number of people that are affected by this, uh, that is a price that's worth paying. And perhaps look at other ways rather than the cap and rather than uh, restricting the, the service that's provided in, uh, in, in to, to reduce costs. Um, finally, I'd, I'd just like to finish by... Um, talking about the Parliament itself and some of the things that we might be able to do here. This has been touched. I think it's wonderful that we have these proceedings signed today. I don't know why we don't have a signer standing beside the Speaker's chair, to be honest, and, you know, filmed for all of the proceedings in, in our Parliament. When you think of the amount of money we spend in this place, the number of staff that we have, the, the amount we spend on maintenance, the amount we're going to spend on refurbishment, I mean, it's not that big a price to make sure that the 30 hours a week or whatever that the chamber is actually in operation and debating that there is a signer there doing it both for the people in the chamber but doing it more importantly for the people who are watching online or the people who are recording the proceedings and wish to, to, to check back on it. Uh, another thing that we could do, of course, is that you, you members, colleagues will be aware that um, there's a scheme in the, in the Parliament, which I, I haven't taken advantage of yet, but I'm sure some have, where you can, uh, you can get tuition in a, in a foreign language. Uh, why don't we add BSL to that? Why don't each of us as MPs have an opportunity to learn BSL as part of our professional development as members of parliament so that we're better able to communicate with our own constituents and so that we're better aware of the, uh, of, of the needs uh, of this technology? So that, that's uh, all I have to say, Ms. But I, I, I just end by again stressing the central point, I think, uh, that I want to make, which is that you cannot underestimate 
the importance of having a legislative framework and the sense of purpose that that gives to civil society, to statutory agencies, and the sense, I suppose, of, of worth that it also gives to those people who are looking for us to respond to their needs in this area. Bruce Pearce. It's a pleasure to see you in the chair. I'd also like to add my gratitude to the member for Poplar and Limehouse, not just for this debate, but for the work he's done for many, many years on this subject. He truly is a great champion. Uh, I'd also like to mention uh, the honourable member for Rochester and Strood for sharing her personal story, which struck me, uh, particularly when she talked about her mother's isolation, because my late mother-in-law was one of the most social people, people you'd ever meet. Um, show her a piano and she'd play for two hours and... And then she lost her hearing, and with losing her hearing, she lost her social circle and became incredibly lonely. And we hear a lot about elderly people being lonely, and I wonder how much hearing loss has something to do with that. Um, this is a very broad debate, and in fact, uh, the debate is as broad as the challenges that face people living with deafness. So I'll confine my remarks to two particular areas. One is cochlear implants. Um, there is a case uh, that's been brought to me by a number of my constituents, one of whom is the grandmother of Jacob. Uh, Jacob needs a cochlear implant. He's profoundly deaf in the right ear and severely deaf in the left. He's four years old. He's been tested by St. Thomas's Hospital cochlear implant team who supported the case for an implant, but the NHS have turned him down. They, the family have been told that they can only have this implant if they can raise £44,000. Now, my constituents are not the most affluent in the country, but they are truly wonderful. And this won't be the first case where they've crowdfunded to help, help somebody. They helped a, a young mother last year to get a second stem cell transplant. And their campaign, which is Help Jacob Here, um, has run boot sales and raffles and fates and they've nearly raised all the money, which is great news. But it does beg the question, what is the NHS for if it is not to help children like Jacob? And spending taxpayers' money at this point surely has the potential to repay handsomely over the lifetime of this young boy. It may be expensive to fund, but what is the expense of not funding, both financial and social? Um, I also wanted to touch on access to work because quite a number of my constituents um, are British Sign Language um, interpreters and many of them have written to me. Um, one of them, um, Joanne, she works regularly with people whom access to work help participate fully and equally at work. Um, in 2015, the DWP, as we've mentioned, imposed a cap on access to work awards. And Joanna is worried that the cap will act as a glass ceiling on deaf colleagues and friends' career aspirations. Those with hearing loss won't be able to apply for promotions or look to develop their career because the access to work support won't be sufficient. So it means they'd only be able to book interpreters for maybe three days a week. So what would happen to the other two days? Deaf professionals are left at a disadvantage with stress and frustration seeing them being removed from viable career paths. Consequences can be a reduction to their working hours or in some cases complete removal from employment. There are self-employed deaf professionals within the arts who haven't been able to develop projects due to lack of access. And research done by the group Deaf ATW with people whose awards have already been capped or due to be capped next year shows negative impact on careers and aspiration. Especially affected are deaf people who are in or aspire to professional, managerial or leadership roles or those who are self-employed and run their own business. Another of my constituents, Andrew, is deaf. He uses British Sign Language and he works as a senior team administrator with Surrey County Council. Access to work pays for the interpreters and the note-taking, which enables his communication with colleagues, customers and others, and helps him participate more fully and equally at work, even though it doesn't stretch to provide assistance at longer meetings, where it is impossible to focus on the interpreter and take notes at the same time. That said, the support he gets via access to work, which we all agree is a fantastic system, is likely to be much more than what would be a reasonable adjustment for his employer to make. In cases like Andrew's access to work, 
has revolutionised the career opportunities of people like him, shattering the glass ceiling which previously limited them often to manual jobs. It has meant a progression for deaf people, which is down to talent, which is what it should be. There are now deaf chief executives, deaf intermediaries working at the Ministry of Justice, deaf theatre directors, deaf social workers, and a deaf senior team administrator at Surrey County Council. And I'm concerned that the new policy will undo that good work. In September, Deaf ATW ran a survey amongst deaf people about access to work. Amongst those who will be subject to the access to work cap from 2018, nearly half said that they would not apply for promotions in future because they were worried that in a new job they wouldn't have enough communication support because of the cap. For the same reason, a fifth said they already had opportunities to apply but had not applied. And nearly half said they would stay with their current employer for as long as possible because they were worried what a new employer might think about the effect of the cap on their ability to do their job. And we hear a lot when we talk about growth about the productivity puzzle. Well, it's no wonder it's not much of a puzzle, really, if we're limiting people in the ability of where their talent can take them by this cut. In around a third of the cases, the employer um, was either taking or thinking about taking action to check whether the individual could still do their job properly. So deaf people fear that having a capped award means they won't be able to do their job properly. And employers are concerned about it too. As a consequence, deaf people, whether capped already, to be capped in 2018, or not capped in their current work, said they're already avoiding applying to work in professional, managerial and senior roles because of this. Back in 2015, the government said that they were clear that one of the key challenges in administering access to work is managing a demand-led program within a defined budget. They said we must achieve a balance between meeting customer need and achieving value for money for the taxpayer. It has been a long-standing aspiration of the programme to support more disabled people into work, so we must address the challenge of supporting the growth while keeping access to work affordable. But I would say that this is money well spent. I couldn't find more recent figures, but in the SACE report in 2011, it set out that for every pound spent, £1.48 came, came back to the Treasury. So this is clearly a spend to save. The Minister may be aware but that in July 2015, the Government responded to the Work and Pension Select Committee report, which was entitled Improving Access to Work for Disabled People. In terms of the statistics, the report was scathing and it said, the lack of transparency is unacceptable. We recommend that the DWP change its approach to access to work statistics and that as a minimum, it regularly publishes the following information. An indicative annual budget, annual expenditure outturns, broken down by support element, the impairment type, including autism spectrum disorders, the number of service users by size of employer, the employer's mandatory and voluntary financial contributions, broken down by <coughs> size of employer. Now, in its response, the government admitted there was work to do to meet these requirements. So can the minister, either now or possibly write to me afterwards, update us on progress of the access to work statistics. We heard from the previous minister who said there were a lot of statistics available. So uh, I would be very pleased if he could write to me after this to let me know what progress has been made on supplying that information. And can the minister also provide figures to show the trend in the numbers of deaf people supported by access to work prior to the initial introduction of the access to work cap and after its introduction? The Select Committee also highlighted a particularly strong case for the DWP to improve the accessibility of its disability-related services, recommending that the DWP introduce a video relay system to enable deaf BSL users to contact the department more easily. Could the Minister advise if there's been any progress on this? And just as a, just a reminder, really, when I got here earlier and I saw the signer, I recalled that when uh, the Work and Pension Select Committee in 2015 actually undertook a review into access to work, um, we had a session where deaf people came and gave evidence and deaf people were in the audience and no one had thought to book a signer. Luckily, one of my constituents had come to watch and he was a qualified signer and took over and, and helped us. But if 
in this place, sometimes we do things very well, and sometimes we really do overlook things. And if a Work and Pension Select Committee looking into um, accessibility for deaf people didn't think to have a signer, then it just goes to show that we really must do better on this. And this is a step forward today. Thank you. Ms. Twist. Calling me to take part in this debate, and it's a pleasure to serve under you as chair. Uh, I'm sure that most of us uh, know many people who are affected by hearing loss to some degree, and we know of the real impact this has on, on their lives. In my own case, both of my parents have been affected. My dad, who died a couple of years ago, had industrial deafness um, uh, caused by his work in a, a factory, and uh, the effects of that lasted um, uh, a long time, clearly. And I welcome the comments made by the, um, the Honourable Member opposite, who has now left, Mr Penning, to uh, recognise the industrial injuries aspect. My mum resisted hearing aids for many years, but the difference which uh, they made to her life when she finally gave in was and continues to be absolutely immense and uh, is immense to us as well, of course. That's why I was so concerned to hear from Action on Hearing Loss who I met recently, that there are some clinical commissioning groups who are proposing restricting uh, the prescription of hearing aids to people with mild and moderate hearing loss. And indeed, some have already done so, like North Staffordshire CCG, which has been referred to earlier. Hearing aids not only make a real difference to people with mild and moderate hearing loss, but research shows that they reduce social isolation and depression. And new evidence suggests that they can reduce the risk of developing dementia. Indeed, a study in The Lancet recognised hearing loss as potentially the largest modifiable risk factor for dementia, uh, so that we can do something about that. I hope that the Minister will make it clear that hearing aids must be provided where they're needed. As my honourable friend, the member for Poplar and Limehouse, has set out clearly, uh, the cash limit on the access to work scheme has also had a significant impact on many people with hearing loss, limiting their ability to do their job properly, or in some cases, meaning that they may not be offered jobs because of the shortfall in financial support. So again, I would ask the government to look again at, at removing or raising the cap. I would also like to echo my honourable friend's call for further work on implementation of the action plan on hearing loss. As he has dis, uh, described it, some good work has been done already, but I would ask the minister to ensure that the government step up uh, its work on implementing the plan. Finally, in the summer, I met Erin. Erin is a young woman who is campaigning with the National Deaf Children's Society to have British Sign Language recognised as a GCSE and made available to all students. I joined the Honourable Member for Waveney and Erin in calling for GSE uh, for British Sign Language to be a GCSE subject. Thank you. Thank you, Cooper. Thank you, um, Ms. Buck, uh, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today. And I want to start by thanking my honourable friend, the member for Poplar and Limehouse, for securing this debate. This is absolutely one of those occasions when the only suitable ministerial and departmental response to the words spoken um, in this debate is urgent action to review, reconsider and change course, helping deaf people working, doing this across government, not working in silos and putting deaf people at the centre of the decision-making process. And, and I also include a really important area which people have talked about quite a lot today, which is the DWP, where access to work actually needs promoting, not capping, because when that cap comes in, unfortunately, that will affect so many of our deaf and hard of hearing constituents um, when we come to the end of the uh, period of grace in April 2018. Now, I'm the eldest child of deaf parents and I was their voice and ears from a very young age and that was invaluable to them to enable them to be easily heard and understood in a deaf world. My dad was born deaf and my mum became deaf at four years of age. And I say I was kidnapped by the deaf community at birth because my culture, my language, and my community is theirs. 
And that poses me quite some difficulties on occasion because I can be very straightforward um, in the way I deal with matters. Now, with my language is, my first language is BSL. Um, not sign supported English, which most people think is BSL, which it is not. And I have to tell, tell you that I was tempted to sign my whole speech. <laughs> and I was going to do that and have the interpreters voice over my comments for my colleagues to give everybody a feel for how it is not to be able to communicate directly, not for a minute, not for a sentence, but for five minutes or however long it takes me to finish this. Um, not to be able to communicate directly to the person you're talking to is really, really strange and difficult. And deaf people feel that, experience that, every single minute of their lives. So, my experiences and the difficulties I saw in communicating um, led me, for example, when I was Lord Mayor, um, to provide every deaf person in Liverpool with a minicom. What I got, um, the way we paid for it, is we got children in schools to learn the deaf alphabet. They saw it as a secret language. They really enjoyed it. I got minicoms for everybody um, who was deaf in Liverpool. You might ask, why was that so important? We talk about isolation, but even though I thought I understood, now, I thought I got it. I'm a product of that environment. I came home with a minicom for my dad, and I gave it to him. He looked at it, and he was so happy. He then got it and went, nine, nine. I went, whoa. And he said, who else can I call? Nobody else has got one. Only the emergency services and the doctor. And I thought, right, I get the message. Every deaf person in Liverpool, and that's what made me realise that I needed to get on with it and get everybody a minicom. So, mobile phones have improved the situation. Um, and as the member for Milton Keynes South has outlined, we're not progressing with transmission services as we should. And Chris Jones is somebody I've known for many years. And it is... a uh, a really important thing, but it's, this agenda is so large, we need the, minister, the ministers across government to start tackling it very quickly. Being able to communicate is, a, is fundamental to doing your job. It's fundamental to doing a good job. So, the evidence um, is clear that access to work is a system that enables deaf people, particularly those who use BSL, to use their own voices in the workplace getting the su communication support that they need. I mean, I can tell you I'm probably, when I think about it, one of the first uh, examples of this, because as a child, and I mean a child, eight, nine onwards, I used to sit on a Friday night, my dad was a plasterer, and he was so good, and I genuinely mean that, that directors of building companies, they couldn't phone him or where, they used to come to my house, sit down around the table, and instead of all these millions of bits of paper going, I was drafted in to be the person from Access to Work. And he, <laughs> and he did really well, he kept getting more and more money, they wanted him, the prices went up, and I did it every few months. So... <laughs> The evidence for me is very clear. This cap doesn't simply hinder deaf people's ability to do their jobs. It will cause them to turn down employment offers and promotions. It might have met, meant my dad didn't get such a good deal for his next contract. It leaves self-employed people in a very precarious position in which the small profits they make, um, and they've worked really hard to earn, go, to, go towards expensive interpretation costs. This is no, absolutely no, not a cost-effective way to work. UK Council on Deafness found that those who, whose income will be capped in, in April, mo nearly half of them said they wouldn't even apply for promotions in future because they worried they wouldn't receive enough communication support. Clearly, this presents barriers to those aspiring for careers in professional, managerial and senior roles. I have a friend who was a head teacher of a deaf school. Without support, how is this, uh, this going to happen? Therefore, we need to allow deaf people to progress as far as their talent allows. I've spoken to many other deaf people in um, lower roles but aspiring to do better, 
And actually, they've stopped looking forwards and are now living every day in fear that they may lose the jobs they have. And every day is a challenge, especially if they lose that support for two days a week. And we all must be clear, deafness is not a limiting learning disability. There is no reason why deaf people can't secure employment in senior roles. As long as government decisions don't dampen down the support they require, central government can, just can't sit back in the hope that the employers and self-employed will simply make up the two-day deficit in the support costs and the cap is, that the cap is estimated to impose, especially when employers are already saying that they're not confident uh, about their business employing a person with a hearing um, loss as it is. We simply can't waste huge swathes of talent. And I know my dad, who was born deaf, sorry, is probably one of the greatest men I've ever known. He was fantastically clever, but he was deaf. Didn't stop him doing anything. And we shouldn't allow that to happen. Sorry. Um, does the minister therefore accept that the cap reimposes limits on the ambitions and financial security of deaf people and leaves the next generation without the belief, without the ability to succeed in a 21st century workplace? They can. My dad did it. He died now, he's 91. He did it before he was a trailblazer. Don't stop the new trailblazers. Help them to forge ahead. It's also vital that the minister recognises the fact that outside this place, the majority of British citizens and employers lack awareness of access to, to work. And that really does help explain why a recent Labour force survey found that 30% of working age people who identify themselves as having a hearing loss are not employed. I actually believe it is higher than that. But the minister, I would ask the minister whether he recognises the need for a single gateway that would provide assistance and advice for employers seeking access to work for their employees um, who are deaf or having a hearing loss. And I'm, I've listened to people um, refer to deafness as an invisible handicap. Absolutely it is. It's an invisible disability. But that also means it's an easy hit for, for cuts, especially in the NHS, education and the DWP. And we must really guard against taking that easy, quick solution in the hope that deaf people, those, the hard of hearing people, won't be able to articulate the anger they feel at the treatment they get. I mean, I, I've got two hearing aids, and I would say to, to the minister, my hearing deteriorated to such an extent that I needed communication support to do my job. Would these rules enable me to do that job effectively as an MP? And if not, how was everybody else supposed to um, do theirs under these rules? Is it not just really jeopardising employment, not helping increase it within the deaf and hard of hearing community? I just want to go on to a slightly different subject. I said before my first language was sign language. And I was delighted earlier this year that the Labour Party manifesto committed to giving BSL full legal recognition. And that would improve the structures and the expectation of full language access through fully qualified interpreters in all aspects, all fields of public life. But that leads to a question. If we don't value, the government doesn't value interpretation, doesn't in value interpreters, then how does that encourage people to take up those roles? And what will we do if people are not learning BSL and are not being there in, as interpreters? We've already got cases where unqualified people are in court um, actually interpreting, and that is wrong. They have no idea about deaf culture, no idea about the nuances and, and what people really mean. There's a difference between somebody who's just learning sign language and who is really fluent or whose first language it is, and understands what a deaf person is really, really saying. Um, so, 
what I would say is we need to value those interpreters. So my, my, my final question almost to the Minister is, does he agree that the legal recognition will provide another means of improving awareness of, of, of deafness, of, of the barriers deaf people uh, are dealing with, and those with um, hearing loss in the workplace? The reason I keep looking up is I keep hearing somebody speaking over there, so I don't know what that is, so I apologise. Um, so improving awareness of the deaf and those with hearing loss in the workplace. And we need to ensure that access to work is extended to many more employers than the current minuscule few who actually use it. I do look forward to hearing the Minister's reply, but I would ask him, he will be judged ultimately on the ability of the deaf population, the deaf community and those with hearing loss, their, their ability to succeed to realise their potentials. And, you know, that means in every part of their lives, particularly in the workplace and in education, because without those two things and health, what are we to do? Please give them the same chances that we get. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today and to take part in this very important debate that's been secured by the Honourable Member for Poplar and Limehouse. Uh, a debate which has also been very consensual across uh, the House, and I think that is extremely welcome. This will be the first time that I have personally ever been signed, as well as it being the first time in a, in a parliamentary debate. And I certainly hope it can become a regular, regular feature in Parliament. And it would be nice if it was on the live feed, not just on the rebroadcast. And I don't know if it's something, or, or whose remit can take it back to the parliamentary authorities or the admin committee to perhaps discuss it further with the broadcasters to, to see how far best we can implement that. And just again to thank the Honourable Member for Popman Limehouse for achieving this today. I think that is a, a tremendous first. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to echo the calls uh, made by the member for Milton Keynes South that um, this should become a regular feature. Um, and various members uh, have, have discussed uh, in points that the multiplicity of government departments that are responsible for this whole sphere. And there certainly does seem to be a need for that to be, at, at the very least, if not just simplified, at least uh, have a, a clear identified lead, uh, which might be a, an, easier, an easier route. We've heard today of the many day-to-day -day difficulties experienced by those who are hard of hearing, affecting one in six people being affected <coughs> by hearing loss, the fact that they're less likely to be in employment. Um, on one hand, it's welcome news that technology is making it easier for people suffering from deafness to work, while on the other hand, it's also worrying that the cap on access to work support has disproportionately impacted those with hearing loss, and that point's been very well made today. I don't think I need to emphasise it any, any further, but the cost-benefit ratio of £1.48 for every pound spent uh, says it all, I think, in, in financial terms. Various members have given their personal stories and accounts. The member for Rochester and Stroud uh, clearly illustrated that. And I was also grateful for the member for uh, Wolverhampton South East for the, the case he identified as, as well, which put a very human dimension onto the whole case. I, I can't imagine what it would be like not to hear my family or listen to music. I have no comprehension of how awful that would be. But there are ways that we can help people and we should do everything we can to, to ensure a better quality of life for everyone. Indeed, that effectively is the challenge of today, is to ensure that deaf people can be fully involved in daily and public life as active, healthy citizens and make informed choices about every aspect of their own lives. My colleague from Edinburgh South covered much of what happens in Scotland. I will mention a few of the points again. We have the Scottish Government British Sign Language National Plan, which, has, as has been said, aims to make Scotland the best place in the world for BSL users to live, work and visit. It seems to be a regular feature in debates. I'm always telling people to come and visit my constituency, so I might as well <laughs> emphasise it again. It's a great place. If you've not been, do, do come. Um, the BSL Scotland Act 2015 requires public bodies in Scotland to publish their plans every six years, showing how they will promote and support BSL. And this plan is the first national plan covering the Scottish Government. And other public bodies, including councils, NHS boards, colleges and universities, will also be publishing plans next year. Um, the national plan, which runs from 2017 to 23, is the first of its kind in the UK and sets out 10 long-term goals for BSL in Scotland, covering early years in education, training and work, health, mental health and well-being, transport, culture and the arts, justice and democracy. It describes 70 actions Scottish ministers will take by 2020, whereafter a progress report shall be published and further 
set of actions for delivery by 2023 will be identified. My honourable friend from Edinburgh East mentioned several of those key action points I don't feel the need to, to do again. I, I can perhaps, however, think of a, a 71st that I might feed into the next round for the Scottish Government, and it's maybe one that we should take forward at this Parliament as well, and that's what we as individual elected members do to facilitate that. And I, in preparing for this debate, thought, what do we do for home visits, for people visiting our constituency offices? The, there's a number of issues there, and maybe we also need parliamentary guidance on how best to service all of our constituents with their inquiries. In, in Scotland, it's, as it's been pointed out by my colleague, it's, a lot of it is, is about attitude, but it, our plan is also backed up by money, and 1.3 million has been put in to support it, which is not a grand amount, but it's enough to do a fair amount of work. The Dr Terry Riley, the chair of the British Deaf Association chair, said, the Scottish Government's national plan is a brilliant example for the rest of the United Kingdom to follow. So hopefully ministers can have a look at what we're doing. And I have a copy here if anyone wants it. It's, I, I'm not hard of hearing. I, I am poor of vision. And I'm pleased to say it's also in quite large print. So it suits, it suits the likes of myself down to the T as well. Of course, it's not just through the BSL national plan which the Scottish Government is taking action to help. The disability delivery plan is another area where we can help by removing barriers and promoting independent living. And with key target being the reduction in the employment gap between disabled people and the rest of the population. And that's been highlighted today that deaf people are not in as, as great an employment advantage position as other members of society are. The Scotland Act 2016 devolved a number of powers to set up employment schemes. Uh, and I quote from it, to assist those at risk of becoming long-term unemployed and to help disabled people into work, including schemes which seek to help employers find suitable employees. And as a result of that uh, power, uh, Fair Start Scotland will operate from 2018 for three years with the aim of helping a minimum of 38,000 people into work. A number of those hopefully will also be deaf people and those of hard of hearing. At a UK level, there also needs to be more done to address, uh, in my opinion, gender, race and disability pay gap and tackling pay inequality and occupational segregation. And to that end, I would support the extension of the pay gap reporting to cover gender, race and disability. And I'd be keen for the Minister's thoughts on that when, when he's summing up. I think better and more statistics could help us greatly in this, in this cause. Another area I would like to hear from the Minister in is in relation to the role of EU law, which has played a huge position in upholding the rights of disabled people and ensuring that these rights must be protected post-Brexit. There are many areas, obviously, uh, but in particular importance to the deaf community, I think, will be the Employment Equality Directive of 2000 and others like the Public Sector Websites and Mobile Applications Directive of 2016. Um, the latter of which requires public sector bodies to ensure that their websites and mobile apps comply with accessibility standards so they can be used by disabled people. Uh, as well as protecting these existing EU measures, it's also important to ensure that the UK is not left behind. And, and, and for example, the EU Accessibility Act is currently being negotiated at an EU... The, I'll say again, the EU Accessibility Act, which is currently being uh, negotiated at an EU level, the Equality and Human Rights Commission has said that it will benefit disabled people by providing common rules on accessibility in relation to computers and operating systems, ATMs, ticketing and check-in machines, smartphones, TV equipment, related to digital television services, telephony services and related equipment. And it would be great to know what the UK proposals will be for these areas in, in the future. And if the Minister can, can look into that, that would be tremendous. Um, there's much we can learn from different countries. I've mentioned, and my colleague from Edinburgh East has mentioned what's happening in Scotland. Um, the member for Milton Keynes South mentioned some of the things that were happening in Australia. Um, so there's a lot we can learn from, and I look forward to hearing the other summing up speeches and seeing this debate go further forward. Thank you. Julie Cooper. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Ms. Fogg. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Uh, and I'd like to thank my honourable friend for bringing this very important subject to our attention. Uh, and to begin by saying how delighted I am to see that, that we do have a, a signer in the room. And it must, it must be a really easy thing for us to extend this across the business of this house. A really quick, a really quick win, I think we'll all agree. And I, I would have to say, it, it's a real privilege uh, to be responding uh, on behalf of... of of the, the opposition in this debate. Uh, I've been genuinely moved by some of the very powerful and personal uh, speeches that we've heard today that prepared me far better for this debate than the research I did ahead of it. Um, 
we can look at the statistics and we, we can know that 11 million people are living in the UK with deafness. Uh, but I think the extent of it, listening here in the House uh, today, uh, the, the member for Rochester and Stroud uh, very courageously shared a very personal story and I think enriched this debate and we thank her for that. Uh, the, the member for Nottingham East talked very movingly of his constituent. We heard of a, a four-year-old, a family of a four-year-old, having to raise £44,000 to, to let a little boy have a chance in life. Um, so I think that we'll all agree that there, there is something more that we must do. And, and probably the best thing about this debate is that it, it has opened uh, and raised an awareness of a, what is an absolutely massive issue. Uh, we, we're talking about deafness, we're talking about loss of hearing, we're talking about people who were born deaf, we're talking about people who become deaf uh, through sometimes through a, a medical uh, illness and, and sometimes uh, through the ageing process. And how are we going to support them all going forward? Uh, beginning with the, the, the children, it is of great concern, and members have mentioned quite rightly the, the concern about the screening process for newborn babies and the fact that only a third of these, uh, quite frankly, come up to standard and are accredited. This needs to be addressed and addressed early, bearing in mind that 50,000 children in the UK are deaf. We must serve them well and make sure that they're not isolated. We must make sure that their isolation doesn't begin with being isolated from the parents because the majority, 90% of children born deaf are actually born to hearing parents. And what implications does this have for the language development of the child if the parents aren't supported? And we know there are ways of supporting with the radio aids and we must make that available to parents to support them going forward. Because we, talk, we hear a lot in this house about early intervention for all children to address all issues in those early years and there can't be any more important issue to address than this. Uh, members are, have quite rightly stressed, uh, the member for West Lancashire said very powerfully, that deaf children do not have learning disabilities. Deaf people do not have learning disabilities. And our education system must address this. It cannot be right that children with deafness are 42% less likely to get five decent GCSEs. We are hindering their progress for life at that early stage and it cannot be the way forward. And I was also alarmed to, to learn that since 2011, the number of specialist teachers for the deaf has actually been reduced by 12%. This can't be the right way forward. Members have quite rightly uh, stressed the importance of British Sign Language. And I, I have to admit, personally, I, I never realised until this week that, and I never thought in, through enough, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, that some pe for some people British Sign Language is their first language. I thought of it somehow as something separate that helped. And, uh, but this increased awareness for me, and I think the more this is talked about, it is absolutely vital that this is taken seriously and giving, given the recognition. We, the UK is a signatory to the, to the UN Convention, but we've got to go more than that and give this language the equal validation that, that it deserves. Why can't it be a GCSE subject? If it were to be a GCSE subject, I know this is beyond the remit of the minister in this department, uh, but I'm sure he'll pass it on to, to uh, his colleague for education. People will take it seriously. More people will learn the language. There will be more access to the language and therefore uh, people with deafness and will, will be able to participate more fully. Uh, members have right, rightly mentioned the cost, the human cost as well as the financial cost of isolation not addressed. Health, the statistics in health are, are quite clear. The, the, the number of, of people who re retire early, suffering anxiety, depression because they no, can no longer cope in the world of work. Uh, people 
uh, many many elderly has been mentioned who, who don't lose their social circle, aren't able to communicate with family. The cost of not supporting them through hearing aids and as, men, as mentioned by the member for uh, Milton Keyes, I believe, uh, supporting them with, with uh, telecommunication, uh, relay text systems. We should be looking into the, these systems to maximise the inclusion for all people. Uh, the world of work uh, is obviously a, a massive issue here. Uh, the, the Access to Work scheme is an absolutely brilliant scheme. What, what is so shocking is that it is probably the DWP's best kept secret. I, I recently hosted a Disability Confidence Employers event and many of them admitted that they, did, they hadn't known about this scheme at all. And there was two aspects to the, the world of work in terms of deafness, in my view. The, the deaf person or the person with hard, who is hard of hearing needs support to cope at work, and but the employer needs support, particularly the small a medium-sized employer, to understand that the, it need not disadvantage their business. And as has been mentioned quite rightly today, you don't get, I think it was the member for Nottingham East who said, you don't get the same churn of workforce when, when you employ a disabled person, if you support them in their workplace. And this support doesn't have to be expensive. And sometimes it's that, that awareness that just moving somebody's seat so they can actually lip read or, or, or letting them sit in a quiet corner of the office where background noise isn't such a, a, an issue for them. Well, they, so it, the, the message from, from the government uh, about the disability confident uh, employers is a very strong and a very useful one. But when, when we now weigh that alongside capping the access to work, it seems to be con sending a contradictory message. Uh, can we afford not to support people in work? What is the cost of not supporting? I would say, what a loss of, of, of talent. Uh, and as, a, as we've said, this debate covers so many areas and not one government department, but not least, uh, the, I would say, the Department for Economic Development, because what is the cost to our economy of not utilising and maximising the potential of, of all our citizens, including the deaf and those with, who are hard of hearing? Uh, so I think going, going forward, what can we do? Uh, to concrete action on this, uh, the action plan of 2015 was very welcome and the recommendations in there, I think there's agreement across the House, all sides, that the, this is a sensible plan. Let, let's see it put into action. Uh, the, the work, similar the work guides of 2017 this year were, were a, an excellent piece of work that I think we, we need to build on. We, so, concrete action, every stage is needed, ensuring that newborn babies are properly screened and that it's always a high quality, supporting parents uh, of deaf children with early intervention, supporting schools, making sure that the specialist teachers are there and that children aren't allowed to feel like second class citizens, and promoting BSLE. Sorry, uh, British Sign Language uh, within schools, allowing it to become a GCS, GCSE subject. We should look uh, to the Scottish example. They're, they're obviously doing an excellent job there. And, and I would say, as somebody who's half Scottish as well, it, it, if they can do it, so can we. And I'm sure we'll do it at least as well. Uh, we must make sure that that equipment is enhanced and not restricted. I was shocked to hear of CCGs that are beginning to restrict hearing <coughs> aids. Uh, in it, the, the criteria for cochlear implants must be reviewed. We must be looking to aid people's hearing, support people to live full lives, not to limit them and look for, look for ways of limiting them. We've got to go back to review that. So I, I would sort of conclude by saying, let us invest in unlocking the potential of the deaf and the hard of hearing. Because our, our economy depends on the talents of all our people. The cost of not 
acting, not only causes misery for individuals who are discriminated against and excluded from society and the world of work, but also stores huge costs in the future for our health support services and, of course, for our economy. The failure to support deaf people to fulfil their potential is costing this economy. I would say that we cannot afford not to act. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Buck. And um, thank you so much to, to all members for such a... I've really enjoyed this debate. And, um, you know, there are many ways I could spend Thursday afternoon. But, but actually, I've really enjoyed this debate. I've learnt a lot. Um, it's been a really consensual debate. And thank you for the excellent tone of, of my Shadow's comments on this. And I really enjoyed what she had to say as well. As everyone has said, let me start by... Congratulating our member for Poplar and Limehouse for securing the debate through the Backbench Committee, but also to our, to our signers. Uh, thank you for, for doing a first, and thank you for working so hard, because um, I, I, can't, I can't sign, but I can only but imagine that it is quite hard work to do this for three hours, and uh, there are two of them, but they've worked really hard over there, and thank you to them for that. Um, I, I don't have hearing problems. Ms. Buck, but I do have a, a sight problem, which is why I have the lectern here in front of me, because the papers are far too far away from me without it, which is why I always put it into play. Let me thank uh, the all-party group as well, and a number of the members from the group have, have spoken today for all the work they do in the House here, raising awareness and improving the way that we support debate. I can't remember in my time in the House a debate on this subject, um, so it's certainly long overdue, and, uh, and all party groups can do that. The Backbench Business Committee is excellent. Now, as we've heard, Ms Buck, um, hearing loss is widespread, affecting one in six of the UK population, it's got a, and it has a massive, massive impact on the lives of, of our constituents and some of the members in, in this House. We've heard today some really incredible uh, contributions. Some really, uh, I agree with um, the lady for Burnley. Some really moving contributions, actually. Um, especially the lady for West Lancashire, I might say. Is that, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Thank you for the way that you put it. I was going to almost intervene on you to give her a chance to, to have a drink, but she was brilliant in the way that she put it. So, so thank, you to, thank you for that. If, if I start by highlighting the, um, the key steps that... that the government is taking to support those with, with hearing loss and, and deafness. I can then move on to, to the other important points that have been raised by members during the debate, and hopefully I can cover them all. If I don't, apologies in advance, I will write to anybody with any points that, that need to be covered. So as we've heard from the Honourable Member for Poplar and Limehouse, in, in March 2015, the Department of Health and NHS England published the Action Plan on Hearing Loss. For, for me, this is a real statement of intent, actually, for action across the health and care sector. There's an, an ongoing programme of work which the Action Plan initiated. There are 20 separate outcome measures, which the Honourable Member touched upon. In September, working with the Department for Work and Pensions and the Department for Education and Hearing Loss Charities, NHS England issued a series of What Works guides, providing examples of what we know works in supporting individuals with hearing loss over the course of their lives. Now, these guides aimed at organisations, providers, commissioners, cover hearing loss and employment, transition to adulthood for young people with hearing loss and hearing loss and healthy ageing, um, and one of the key actions of the plan is the need for, for clear guidance from commissioners. And in July 2016, NHS England published the Commissioning Services for People with Hearing Loss, a framework for clinical commissioning groups. Snappy titles, Ms Buck, we do not do in the NHS, as I have learned since arriving there as a minister. But as the Minister Responsible for Public Health, I'm... I'm very pleased to see this recognises hearing loss as a, quote, major public health challenge, and I think that's exactly what it is. Um, it's a, but it is a major step forward, I think, in focusing local commissioners on tackling uncorrected hearing loss and on addressing the variation in access and quality of services that we have across the country. The framework has been developed with a range of stakeholders, including the voluntary sector groups and professional representative groups, such as Action on Hearing Loss, who we've heard mentioned today, the British Tinnitus Association, Ditto, who are, who are all members of the Hearing Loss and Deafness Alliance. The guidance is crucial for me in ensuring consistency across the CCG commissioning in England and supporting those commissioners as they make decisions on what is effective and good value for their local populations. In turn, I think it will help reduce inequalities in access and outcomes from hearing services. And I recognise the need for us to, to maintain momentum on this and to ensure that the action plan secures positive outcomes for those with, with hearing loss and deafness. Let me turn to, to, 
the points, hopefully all of them, that have been, been raised. I would say in, in response to the member for Hemel Hempstead, who I know had to run away, um, my former boss, uh, not, only am I, not only am I not the Minister for Education, DWP, DCMS, uh, or, or others, I, I'm not even the Minister within Health that covers this area, but <laughs> never, let, never let that stop a, a, a happy Minister. And uh, as I say, I have really enjoyed uh, listening to this debate today and, and to respond to it. So what I'll do is, let me try and take the points in terms of those that have been raised most, I think, during the debate. It's probably the smartest way to do it. So... Um, the member for Poppy Limehouse in opening the debate, the member for Bristol East, um, who mentioned her constituent, the member for Hemel Hempstead, and pretty much everybody else who's spoken has mentioned the access to work scheme. So I, I recognise members' concerns about the impact of changes to access to work. I understand, of course, that the Honourable Member uh, for Parliament Limehouse, I think, is going to be meeting with the, the member for Truro, the new, new Minister for Disabled People, uh, Health and Work, in the, early in the new year to discuss in more detail access to work and, and the concerns that he has about that. And I'm sure members will realise that I'm very, very, very clearly not uh, the lady for Truro. But I, I spoke to her uh, at lunchtime today ahead of this debate, and, uh, and I was also on the front bench with her just, just earlier on this afternoon for, for the statement on the new um, command paper. And, and we will speak after the debate and make sure that she is fully up to date on everything that has, that has been raised that comes within her portfolio. Resources, I think it's worth putting on the record, resources for access uh, to work were, were increased in real terms in the 2015 spending review, and I appreciate members have all s have spoken positively about access to work as a, as a scheme, but, but resources within a publicly funded health service are, are still finite, and they also need to be allocated to the growing numbers coming to the scheme. That's 8% more people had uh, AT work, ATW, or Access to Work provision, approved last year than the previous year, including 13% more, more deaf people. Last year, we spent £104 million on the Access to Work grants, an increase from £97 million the year before. So, as has been said by a number of members, Access to Work is a demand-led scheme, and therefore the number and level of awards will reflect this, and we, we intend for it to continue to, to meet demand, and the, the numbers continue to go up. I, I don't accept the maximum level of support is too low. I think the amount of help an individual may receive for, from Access for Work depends on their individual needs and their personal circumstances, up to the current maximum of 42,100 per year, rising to 43,100 from April next year. Um, but this is, this is one and a half times the average salary. That's far more than most, certainly my constituents, and I'm sure every, every member in this room earn. Transitional arrangements are in place for existing recipients and those who made a claim before October 2015. The changes don't apply until April 18, as I said, provided their needs remain the same. The people will receive annual reviews of their progress and support in the transition to the award level. The government continually monitors the application of the cap and considering if any further flexibilities might be might be required. Uh, it's another point I discussed with the member for Truro before the debate today. Uh, I think she's acutely aware of the situation. It's not often a minister is able to stand up uh, at a Westminster Hall debate and actually uh, on the day that something new has been announced and to touch on something new. But, uh, but I have to say this, this, this document, um, this command paper, Improving Lives, the Future of Work, Health and Disability, uh, which sets our response to last year's Green Paper consultation. Um, in, in this document, and it's a, it's a weighty tome which I and members will want to, to study and read through, we set out how those users with the greatest needs, such as some British Sign Language users, will be offered new managed personal budgets as well as workplace assessments um, involving their employers to help meet the needs within their award level. And deaf customers will also be supported by a dedicated team of special advisors. I, I thought the, the member for Eastbourne, who is indeed back, and, uh, and who indeed is, is indeed a friend from the, the grand old days of the coalition, as he put it. Um, I know he had, to, had to, to get away, but I thought his point about SMEs was incredibly well made um, and, and is well noted. The member for Hemel Hempstead referred to the point about how you employ employing disabled people, you get lower churn. A number of people have uh, reflected that message in their comments since, and I think that is absolutely right. Mentioned in the chamber earlier during the statement was a, a company that are based in my constituency called Microlink PC, and. Um, they work with large and small, big banks in the city and small SMEs across the country. And their, the whole focus of their business is to use technology to help uh, people, disabled people, into work. And that of, uh, absolutely includes people with, with, 
with deafness and hearing loss. And of course, many, many people across the charity sector uh, work, work as well to, to, help, to help that happen. So I heard the member for Poplar Limehouse, I saw him there standing on the back row during the statement earlier, um, and I knew exactly what he was going to say, and, uh, and he didn't disappoint when he raised the cap, and all I can say is I, I wrote down here on my, on my notes the, the comments of the Secretary of State, which I know that he will have noted too, and he'll be bringing up with the member for Truro when he meets her, uh, continue to review, continue to look at the evidence. So I would encourage him to press on that, and to continue to look at the evidence, because he has that there in black and white from, from the Secretary of State. Um, so he mentioned, as did the member for Eastbourne and uh, the lady for Bladen, who's also gone, um, and so did pretty much everybody else who spoke, around the legal recognition of British Sign Language and the case for, for BSL GCSE. It is not entirely clear to me which department would lead on legal recognition of British Sign Language, which is kind of the problem that so many people have, uh, have referred to today. I, I, personally, I am sympathetic to the, to the calls for, for strengthening the role of British Sign Language, and, uh, and we certainly want to see as many people trained and providing support as possible. The, the message that I, that I can only bring today is that at, at this time, uh, Her Majesty's Government is not yet anyway convinced that the way to achieve this is through legislation. The, the Department for for Work and Pensions undertook an extensive market review of which the, the final report was published in July of this year. This demonstrated that communication requirements, Ms Buck, should be addressed on an individual basis and that there is no universal approach to addressing these needs. Now, we have protections of the legal rights of people who are deaf in the Equality Act, of course, and in the duties of the NHS and the mandate that I am responsible for giving to NHS England and, of course, publicly funded social care organisations to conform to, to what we call the, the accessible information information standard. I'm very happy to take this point away. It's come across really clearly from so many members during the debate today. Um, and all I would say is that the private member's ballot is a wonderful thing. On the subject of GCSE, obviously any changes to the, to the school curriculum, particularly the establishment of new GCSEs, is something for, for the Department for Education and something that members will have to, the all party group will have to take up with them. I, I know from, from talking to them before today's debate, because I suspected this would come up, that they, they say there are no plans at, at this time to introduce further GCSEs beyond those to which the government's already committed, but something tells me the member of Poplar and Limehouse and uh, the member of Hemel Hempstead and Eastbourne and the other members who've spoken today will. Um, well, with their usual determination, follow this through with uh, ministers at the Department for Education who will no doubt note their comments from this debate today. Um, the member leading the debate and also the member for Wolverhampton South East uh, talked about the assessment, and as did others, of course, the assessment criteria for cochlear implants. They were indeed debated in March when the, uh, the member had an adjournment debate in which he highlighted the, the report of the Ear Foundation and he called for a nice review, for NICE to review its cochlear implants technology appraisal. As the Honourable Member will know, NICE is an independent and expert body which advises us at the department and it has discretion to review its guidance in the light of any new evidence. NICE is currently working on a, on a, on a list review for this particular technology appraisal and uh, will consult, they tell me, with stakeholders in 2018 in the new year. So I will make sure that member that he gets early sight of that so he doesn't have to go looking for it or hear about it on the, on the media um, and all other members who, who've raised this. Uh, I am absolutely sure that, that this will include consideration of thresholds and criteria for getting cochlear implant. I understand that NICE are planning this consultation because of their recognition of how important this is going beyond the usual review process. So I hope that, uh, although it doesn't give him exactly the clarity that he wants, I hope that, that is helpful in, in some way to him. Um, again, the member for Popham Limehouse and the member for Milton Keynes South, who I thought spoke excellently about this, they talked about the provision of functional equivalent telecom services, so video, video text relay services. Um, Again, obviously, telecommunications are, do not sit within the Department of Health. No matter how big our remit, I don't think we, we have that one, Ms. Buck. But um, it's very good to hear that companies such as 3 and Deaf Plus are at the forefront of providing the equivalent services for their hard-of-hearing customers. I wish Deaf Plus all the best in their, um, their 
this is the Helpline Partnership Awards that, that they've been nominated for. I, I understand that Ms. Buck, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport have previously considered the issue of provision of telecom services despite it being a commercial decision for the, for the public facing companies themselves to decide upon. This has included the department engaging with companies and industry and ministers writing to the FTSE 100 companies seeking views. I hear that feedback from this included views that there were better means of meeting needs of consumers with less reliance upon video relay services. I'm of course happy to raise the issues that members have, have highlighted with, with DCMS colleagues uh, and see what further engagement can be done and I will of course recommend that they look at the Australia example which my honourable friend member for Milton Keynes South spoke about in such glowing terms. The, the Deaf Olympics was raised by the member leading the debate. Uh, my honourable friend, the member for Chatham and Ellsford, the sports minister, I understand has instructed officials in her department to look into how we can ensure greater recognition for the Deaf Olympics in this country and she will consider their advice in due course. She's a very accessible minister and I know that the member for Popham Limehouse knows her so he will no doubt take that up with her as well. Um, a number of people, including the member leading the debate and uh, my friend, the member for Waveney and uh, the lady for Bristol East talked about in Improving paediatric audiology services by the the IQIPS, the the, the, the IQIPS, the improving quality and psychological services for the record, Ms. Buck. So concerns have indeed been raised in relation to accreditation of of paediatric audiology services. The independent process of accreditation, the the IQIPS services, is there to ensure all providers meet a common standard. We want all providers to have completed accreditation as quickly as possible. The commissioning framework encourages CCGs, care commissioning groups, to require providers to have completed the IQIP self-assessment tool and to have applied for and achieved accreditation within the duration of their contract. Commissioners must be the one, though, who drive this forward. The accreditation process for, for us is an effective means of testing against the standard. If during an assessment mandatory findings are raised, which show non-conformity to any part of it, then the service agrees appropriate and proven actions with the UCAS team to rectify these and prevent it reoccurring. The member Popham Limehouse and so many, and I even mentioned it, my, I raise it, my, I question myself on this as to which government department leads on, on British Sign Language, on BSL. I, I completely appreciate the frustration, uh, you know, in that, that there can only ever be one minister at the box, but what you really need is a triumphant of, uh, of, of me merged into the Honourable Lady for Truro and the Honourable Lady for Chatham and Ellsford, which would be an interesting sight. Uh, but I, I totally appreciate the frustration that there is no single government department which leads on British Sign Language. I suppose, you know, in, in, probably, in probably just making the point worse, I suppose it would depend on the context. So be it, be it in education, which would be for, for obviously DfE, or how BSL is used in health settings in line with the accessible standard that I mentioned, that would obviously be for, for my, my colleagues at, at the Department of Health. But I, but I totally take his point and, and I won't take that away. Um, the member for Eastbourne, who, who I do know well and, uh, and, and is welcome, welcome back to the House, talked about screening for hearing loss in adults. And he made, made the point very well that we don't just focus on people with complete hearing loss. He, he, he said to me the other day that his fear was the debate would be about the deaf deaf, um, as, he, as he put it. And he wants to ensure that people with partial hearing loss get the support they need. He made the point very well, I thought, that people begin to lose their hearing later in life as, as age catches up with us all. Um, but, but they sort of accept this as part of the natural ageing process and they're often reluctant to admit they have a hearing problem and don't seek as prompt support as they might with other uh, conditions and as we've heard they often and he, he said they often wait years before going for a hearing test so we heard calls from him Ms Buck for for the introduction of a hearing loss screening program for the people at the age of 66 once they reach retirement and as part of the NHS health check for people age 40 to 70 and, I'm, and I am I am responsible for the health check program so, so the current advice from the UK National Screening Committee, the expert group which advises ministers on all aspects of screening, is that the evidence doesn't demonstrate that universal screening would provide any hearing-related improvement in quality of life in comparison to hearing loss identified th through other channels. However, I think the member for Eastbourne does make a persuasive argument that we can do more to identify hearing loss as people reach old, older age. And, uh, and I, he said that the 
the, um, the general election intervened. Um, but he, as he said, he is also back. And uh, I don't doubt that I will be hearing from him again, probably at Health Questions in a couple of weeks' time on this subject, and, uh, and would be more than happy to do so, uh, to be honest. He also, the member for Eastbourne, this is mentioned that CCD's commissioning of audiology services. So NHS England's commissioning framework captures the importance of audiology and monthly waiting times, data for audiology are indeed collected, Ms. Buck, and they can be used and should be used by members and by the public to hold commissioners to account. Touch on the member for Waveney, who, who spoke about, my humble friend, who spoke about support for children with hearing loss, and he spoke about his constituent son, Daniel. Um, it's so often the case, isn't it? And I, I ran, I was a vice chair of the, of the all-party autism group for many years when I was on the back benches, and we often used to hear in that group about um, the, the so-called middle-class parents with the sharp elbows who managed to get their children what their children needed. And, uh, and of course, that, that's only human nature, but it shouldn't be the sharp elbows of the middle classes or anybody else that gets their children what they need. That's what the state is there for, in, in, in my opinion. Children with a, with a special educational need as a result of their deafness will will benefit from the more integrated approach, I think, to, to meeting their needs. Since 2014, a new framework requires CCGs and local authorities to make joint arrangements for assessing the range of eligible children's needs and the development of what he rightly referred to as the education, health and care plans to provide necessary support. And I think every member in this debate and every member in this house ha has casework around EHCPs. These arrangements are transforming the support available to children and young people by joining up services for, for zero to 25 year olds, this is the scope they have across education, health and social care, and by focusing on the positive outcomes. He, he, he is right to take up the casework and I, and I, and I do, do it myself and I think that the, the performance of local authorities is vastly different across the country and I know from speaking to him uh, outside of this debate that he is working very closely with his local authority as I would expect him to do so and that he has been impressed by the improvements that they've made. I don't doubt that's because of the pressure that he's put on them. He actually used the term in his speech and I wrote it down, the right support right from the start and I don't think that was any accident because I had an invitation today uh, as a member of parliament as we all did from the National, National Deaf Children's Society which he referred to in his remarks uh, that requesting the pleasure of my company at an event on the 10th of January, Ms. Buck, called Technology and Deaf Children, Getting the Right Support Right from the Start. And, uh, and Mr. Speaker has very kindly allowed that to be in the state rooms and Speaker's House at lunchtime on the 10th of January. And I think that will be an excellent event, and I hope it's well attended. I suspect it will be by all members, by all members in this room. Um, what else can I move on to? Uh, special Educational Needs Funding. The member for Waveney touched on that as well, didn't he? Um, the implementation of, the, of the, the new SEN system has been supported by significant new investment, Ms. Buck. That includes £70 million in 1415, £113 million in 1414 through to 17 in the implementation funding, um, and £45 million in the same period for independent supporters for families. Ofsted and the CQC are reviewing all local authorities. Uh, and they, sh they know this, and their CCG partners in how they work together the, to meet the needs of children with SEN as the EHCPs come, come into force. So the, uh, the assessment criteria is there, and it is very much on their, on their shoulders. My humble friend, the lady for Rochester and Strood, in a brilliant speech, if I may say so, uh, a very personal speech, which is, it's never easy to do that in this place. Uh, you, you get lots of retweets for doing it but it's, um, that's the easy bit. It's really hard to do it. And to mention uh, her mum's story, I thought she spoke brilliantly, and she used the term invisible disability, which the, the lady for Burnley also used in her, in her remarks. Um, she, said, um, she said deafness can take many different forms and have impacts, physical and mental. And I thought she made the case really, really coherently. The member for Hemel Hempstead, just to touch on, on him again, my, my former boss. I, I, for the record, I don't mind at all when former ministers um, come to debates that I'm responding to, especially when they're former ministers uh, for a department that, I, that I'm not responsible for. Um, <laughs> It, I thought he made the point very well about the scale of the issue of the sort of the hidden deafness uh, that there is in this country, and he gave his example of, of industrial cause of, of, of deafness as well. 
The member for Edinburgh East told us about the, the BSL Scotland Act and the ensuing National Action Plan, which he directed colleagues to look at, and I will direct colleagues within the UK government to look at that. Um, hats off to the honourable gentleman for his attempt at signing the start of his speech. I thought that was a very brave, brave move. So thank you to him for his remarks. The, the lady for Erith and Thamesmead, she spoke, I thought, very well and made the point about loneliness. Uh, and, I, and I wonder whether the, the Loneliness Commission that, that, that our former colleague Joe Cox set up, I wonder whether that touched on the issue of deafness and its impact on loneliness. It would be very interesting to know those that are taking that forward, whether they... Um, whether they do. She spoke about Jacob um, and the story of Jacob and crowd, crowdfunding within her constituency uh, for, for his cochlear implant. And clearly, I, I don't know the details of his particular case, and so it wouldn't be fair for me, for me to comment. But it sounds like her community are, are showing incredible grace to that little boy. And um, it would be wonderful to see him here in the house when, um, when he's had his, had his implant. She also raised the issue of the access to work cap again. Um, I will write to her, or rather my DWP colleagues will, on, on the point, the, quest, the specific questions. She, she asked some specific numbers questions, and I will write to her on those, those points that she raises. The, the, the lady from West Lancashire, who I've already referred to, she spoke about her kidnap by the, uh, the deaf community, and, uh, and I will say again, it was a very emotional speech. Um, I so wish she had done what she threatened to do, which was to sign her entire speech, as long as she'd given me a copy of it beforehand. So I'm... You know, I, I like to think I can, can cope, but I wouldn't have coped with, it, with all of that. But I, but I thank her for her comments, especially about a single gateway, which I thought was very well made. And um, I know she's a member of the DWP Select Committee, and I suspect she is a member of the All Party, of the Health Collect Select Committee, sorry. Um, but I know she's also, I'm sure, a member of the All Party Group, and uh, maybe she will be involved in making that suggestion to the, to the new Minister for Disabled People and talking about the cap on access to work when, when they meet with her. She also referred to invisible disability. The, the member for Linlithgow and East Falkirk, which I hope I've got that right, um, the points he made about the gender gap and about the EU law post-Brexit, they definitely don't fall within my, uh, my remit, Ms. Buck. But, um, you know, I, I, can, I can, of course, write, write to him on those points. But I would say that, you know, we, we, have, we have colloquially known the, the EU withdrawal bill, or the re repeal bill, as it's colloquial known. Um, and we've had some, some taste in the last week or so around the issue of animal rights. And uh, I have to say, actually, as a, as a government MP and a government minister, I, I do take slight umbrage at the suggestion, not that he made this suggestion at all, but that the suggestion that's made that somehow we need the EU in order to have uh, good rights to look after animals in our country, let alone our citizens in our country. And uh, I don't buy that for one, for one minute. We will in, import that regulation through the withdrawal bill, and then we will look at it as a sovereign parliament and decide where we can improve on it. And I'm sure there are ways that we can do that. And I would also say, Ms. but with the members in this debate and the other members that are interested in this subject, I somehow think this subject is not going to go unheard. So in closing, and then I will give, give a couple of minutes to the member of Popham Limehouse to close before we, we must close this at 4.30. I hope that we had a very interesting debate, but we've also had a very honest debate, and I hope I've been able to demonstrate across my now clearly expanding portfolio to, to honourable members that we've got a very strong framework for supporting people with, with hearing loss through a set of quality and commissioning criteria, of course within a restricted budget, because that is, that is always going to be the case, but setting the expectations for commissioners and providers is what we in the Department of Health are, are obviously mostly interested in. There's the dedicated action plan on hearing loss being spearheaded by NHS England, for which I'm responsible, and of course there's all the, the stuff, that's the multi-agency approach that's enshrined in the action plan. We are doing a lot. Of course, we can always do more. There have been some really, really good points made into today's debate. Whether more people are watching today's debate than pointless, I don't know. But um, I would say that if more people watch debates like this, they'd have a far better opinion of Parliament than maybe some of them do. So we have shown a really good debate today. Uh, we've covered a huge amount of ground. And I thank very much members for their contributions, which have all been from the heart and all been incredibly well informed. And uh, we'll look forward to following up on many of the issues raised. Fitzpatrick. Ms. Buck, I'm very grateful for the opportunity of a few minutes just to, uh, to sum up. And invariably, when 
um, whichever colleague has sums up in these debates, they always say we've had a good discussion, but not only is that the case here, it's been an exceptional debate, and I thank everybody who has contributed. There's been a very personal theme, but even those colleagues who didn't raise a personal experience clearly have a grasp of their constituents um, of the importance of, of this subject. Uh, and I have to say, for those of you who are not on the um, all-party parliamentary group mailing list, you are now, but I suspect everybody already is, um, the member for Milton Keynes um, put his finger on the big issue, which other, others have mentioned. It's cross-departmental. We really need a champion, and I'll come back to that minister in due course. My right honourable friend from Wolverhampton South East um, was on cochlear implants and NICE, and the minister says that's now back. It'll be nine months late, but hopefully it'll be coming. The honourable lady for Rochester and Stroud, um, as the minister said, covered her mum's story very powerfully. She did bring a tear to my eye. She saw me wiping that because it was such a great explanation of uh, an individual person's difficulty, but we're told with, with clear personal commitment. And she made the point about how important it is um, to get uh, children born deaf in the first three and a half years through organisations like Auditory Verbal because the brains can still learn to speak um, after that, it's far too late, and that's why the pathway is, is so important. The Honourable Gentleman from Eastbourne, again, powerful personal experience. I wasn't sure if he was making a bid to come back as the chair of your party parliamentary group, but he'll let you wait for the AGM for that. But he's a great vice chair, and I'm very pleased to see him uh, there. The Honourable Gentleman from Waveney and Hemel Hempstead both called me their honourable friend. That doesn't do me any favours on this side of the house, but... <laughs> Um, but I know what it means because we've done a lot of good work on a number of committees, especially on the fire issue, and we are friends. And it does um, tell people outside that although we might not be in the same division lobby very often, that we do have friends across the chamber and we do work when there is common purpose, and that's really important. My honourable friend from uh, Bristol um, uh, went on ICIPS and uh, uh, accreditation. Um, an honourable gentleman from Hemel Hempstead, but his experience as Minister of State from Access to Work is a powerful ally. The Honourable Gentleman from Edinburgh East, who's just left to cast his train, um, talked about BSL, money being available for BSL at lessons here. That ought to be the case. I'm sure it is the case. I think we just need to explore that. Uh, but he did make the point through his own signage, and it reminded me, and it, and it tickled me, that so much of sign language is common sense, like book. Um, but he mentioned the one, Scotland, which is bagpipes, which like, is really tickles me every time um, that I, I, I see that. And, but he made the point and very clearly about the legislative power of having legislation. The Honourable from Thamesmead and our story about Jacob uh, and crowdfunding, uh, again powerful, as was the, uh, uh, the personal story from the Honourable Lady from Bladen. And my Honourable friend from West Lancashire, uh, with her stories about being, uh, having BSL as her first language um, and the access to work issues, and the story about the Liverpool Minicoms and her dad, of whom she is clearly very, very, very proud, and rightly so. Um, I'm sure it touched everybody in the room. I have to say, the politics came from the three front benches. You know, the place got back to normal when they started talking, uh, which is no, dis no disrespect at all, because you are dealing it from a, po a, a political point of view. But the speeches from Lilithgow and, and Falkirk from Burnley and from the minister clearly understood the issues, uh, and we're very grateful for that. Um, my final point, uh, Ms. Bok, is that we do need a champion in government. BSL needs a champion in government. At some point, a government department, a Secretary of State, is going to have to say to a minister, you're the person for the job. Um, and then we can all go and support that person uh, and get um, a, a better hearing in government. I think it's been a very powerful debate. I'm very grateful to both signers for, for being here. Um, and to the House authorities for facilitating that. I hope this is the first of uh, many opportunities and it becomes the norm. And I'm grateful, Ms. Buck, for the opportunity to say these few words in closing. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered deafness and hearing loss. As many of that opinion say aye. 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 On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order. And can I just also say from the Chair, can we thank the two speakers, uh, Sally McGreevy and Richard Law, for this afternoon. I think on behalf of all of us, we greatly appreciate their work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah.